Pop Up Jim Fannin Show. We got the Regional Council Special Meeting coming up in just minutes. Try and carry it for you live, incomplete, in full, incomplete. Here's the agenda. Special meeting on restrictions that Dr. Mustafa Hirji has inflicted on our local business community, and they are not taking it. (laughs) Hirji who did not have the will of counsel behind him because he is afforded the powers set on to him by the province. (laughs) And Laura Yep, who was on the show earlier, not with me, but with Matt Holmes of 610 CKTB, who interviewed Dean Allison, and I understand interviewed Mark Wood of the 40 Public House, Grantham House in the office downtown. Owns a few... Businesses in the industry. I didn't think he would talk to him. Grand LaFleche. What up? The newest member of the group. I will give you the group. um, Soon. If you want to join. You also have a Zoom link. If you want to get in and vent. It's going to be a long meeting. It's going to be boring for the most part. I'll try and help you out with that. I'm not sure how good of a job I'll do. I'm going to try and uh, bring you a little bit of entertainment anyway. But here is the agenda for the meeting today. 4.30 it starts. It's in three minutes. If they go on time, we'll be live, okay? And... Oh, dear. CNN's claiming that the world is going to end. Imagine that. That's not right. (laughs) What else is new? If you send me a message, Ryan Lunn, it'll pop up on my screen. Don't do it while I'm live. Here's the group. United Hospitality Niagara. How many members we got here? It's a public group, so anyone can see what you do, and you can share from the group. Also, anyone can see the membership of the group. I'm a member, and I see that Grant LaFleche is a member now as well. Welcome, Grant. Where do we find the members? Members. Where's the members? Members. Here we go. How many we got? Why can't I? Why am I? What's going on here? <laughs> uh, where's I just need a total, dudes. 2,015 members. Wow, that's up 500 from yesterday. United Hospitality Niagara. Mark Wood set this up, and it's been a productive group so far. Pretty positive. Also, if you have evidence of threats that have been made to Dr. Hirji, forward them. Share them. I want to see them. I want to see if he's actually been threatened or is it just a matter of a difference of opinion? 20 are watching now, waited online. This is an unlisted link, but you can get this through the region. If you go to the region site, you don't have to watch it with me. You can go watch it by yourself without the commentary. One minute till showtime. I wonder, do they start on time, Regional Council? Here's the agenda. Here's the link. I don't know if you can see the link. No, you can't see the link. I got it cropped. This is United Hospitality in Niagara. And I've been posting all day. Doug Ford says it's ridiculous that people are harassing Niagara's acting medical officer of health. And a uh, poster said earlier, if he's so great, why is he still acting? And Ford says he's more than tired of these anti-maskers who aren't following the rules. That See, 
if you're not wearing a mask or you're seeing your family, you're the problem. But see, Dougie, the meeting isn't about masks. (laughs) Fuck me. The meeting's on an unnecessary targeting of an industry that is not responsible for being the main cause of spreading. As I turn my microphone to speak into the right side of it. What an idiot. I've never done this before. Why are we targeting? Unnecessarily targeting an industry that is not responsible for transmitting the disease. That's what this meeting is about. Actually, the meeting is about apparently because the region as a council can't actually tell Dr. Hirji what to do. So, man, I give Mark Wood a lot of props for stepping up to the plate. This is putting yourself out there in a way that is uncomfortable and may not be appreciated by everyone. So props to you, Mark. But this is about, man, we got to learn to live with this flu, right? And the misinformation and the fear that's going on out there. I did, uh, actually, I have an interview with Mark Wood that I talked to him for about an hour. I thought it was pretty good because it's important that you know who this guy is. To me, it is anyway. And so we talked about it. Have you been involved in political activism before? Nope, never. What are you passionate about? I asked him. He goes, well, we find it strange that uh, we have a criminal that's leading the nation as prime minister. I thought that was pretty good. (laughs) No, please tell me what you think, dude. Anyways, I do have an interview. Wherever you're watching this now, if you're walk, watching on fake book, what up? If you're watching on Twitch, we get some action there. D Live YouTube on the True Tube channel. I don't think if you search Jim Fan and you'll find it. Search True Tube on YouTube and you'll find it. Wherever you're watching this, you should be able to see my interview with Mark Wood that I had a couple days ago. He was great. Passionate, wound up, not going to take it lying down, and I appreciated his time. I actually only heard him, knew of him, because he had a segment with Lori um, Sadowski. What the fuck? Why can't I remember people's names when I'm live? Chrissy Sadowski on 610 CKTB, who was filling in for Shelby Knox, who was filling in for a vacationing Tim Dennis. Chrissy actually does a pretty nice job on air. I don't agree with a lot of her stuff. Some of the stuff I do, but she's always been decent to me. I like Chrissy. And she did a nice job. I think she did a better job than actually some of the paid uh, regular hosts. They're on that station. So props to you, Chrissy. Well done. So I heard Mark as I was going. I was, did you know that you can go get your green bin replaced free? Yeah. Uh, So as I was pulling into Goodwill on Welland Avenue, I heard Mark's interview. I stuck around in the car before I went into the establishment and I stuck around. Chrissy, nice job. See, here's what a pro does. After you're done the interview, you announce who you were speaking to. Chrissy did that. Not only did she say, thanks, Mark, but then she went back and said, Mark Wood of the 40 public house, blah, blah, blah. Nice job. That's the only reason I knew who the hell was talking because I came into the conversation halfway through. It's 4.35 p.m. EST, and it looks like we're getting ready to roll. I know that this is important to you. Oh, you don't want 
We got Matthew James Blake in the background. We don't want that. Councillor DeCero. Okay, ro roll call. Councillor Easton. Present. Councillor Edgar. This is the boring part, I guess. Well, Gary Zalepa I'm Jr. I'm here. No, Gary Zalepa, I'm very fond of because he knows politics. Present. Not like some of these Councilor other jam tarts. Present. Councilor Houston. Mayor Diodati, giving <laughs> he's turning the camera so you can see out the window. Okay. Councillor Councillor Nicholson. Present. Diodati's looking Present. good, man. Present. If I was gay, he wouldn't be my type, but he's he's still looking good. <laughs> last time I well, not the last time, but I felt like telling him, dude, eat a cookie or ten. Now, Walter Senzik, you'll notice, will eat and drink all the way. I'm okay with it, but do you need to have your face full and chomping the whole time? On the, you're in a meeting. Eat before, dude. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any changes to the order of the items on the agenda? If not, uh, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Yes, a uh, chair, uh, Councillor. Oh, well, we, first of all, we need a mover and, a, and seconder to adopt the agenda. I see any hands there. Looks like Councillor Houston. It looks like Councillor Zalepa is seconding that. He adopt the agenda. Do, uh, yes or no on that? Electronically, please. Clerk will <clears throat> tell me. It is carried. I'm informed by the clerk. It is carried. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Chair, uh, Councillor Dart here. I have to declare a conflict of interest. Grudgingly, I would like to participate, but I cannot. I've been advised by legal counsel. Uh, I have a conflict of interest. I'm one of the owners of property in Port Dalhousie, St. Catharines. Um, uh, Lock Street Brewery is one of our um, tenants, and so therefore I, I must declare a conflict of interest. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Councillor Dart, for that explanation. I would uh, now go to uh, opportunity of interest. Uh, uh, prior to uh, hearing the presentations, I have a few remarks. Um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us here this afternoon. I know this special meeting was called on short notice, so I really do appreciate everyone making the time to attend this special meeting. Tonight's meeting is especially timely as it has a singular focus on our response to the second wave of COVID-19 in Niagara. In addition to hearing from our acting medical officer of health, there are two registered delegations that have information to share with council. There are also a series of motions for council's debate and consideration that are designed to provide support to our local businesses that may feel unintended repercussions from the recent public health orders that have been made by the province and our local public health department. Before we move forward with the balance of the agenda, I want to recognize that this term of, it, of council has generally maintained a tone of respect when conducting debate. Even when councillors are debating an issue passionately, I have observed that they generally do so in a polite and, courtesy, and a courteous way. I would expect this tone will continue this evening as we navigate through these important items. I also want to echo some of the comments made by uh, Premier Ford and Minister of Health uh, this afternoon, both of them. And I, uh, while I can appreciate the passion some members of our community have regarding recent public health orders, I want to reiterate to Dr. Herchie, the staff in public health, and in fact, all the staff who work for uh, the Niagara region have been working tirelessly for the people of Niagara since the beginning 
of the pandemic. It certainly, as we all know, is acceptable to disagree with the policy decision, and it's reasonable to request further rationale and even offer constructive alternatives. However, I, I think this council has indicated that uh, we do not find it acceptable to use harassing or threatening languages, language, and I do not anticipate that to happen in any event. We may disagree with the uh, uh, Section 22 order, but I want everyone to know that the Acting Medical Officer of Health did not make this decision lightly and did so to help protect our community. I also want to thank Niagara's business community, and I want them to, to know that we are all uh, very sympathetic to the unintended impacts these public health orders have on restaurants across the region. The motions that will be discussed tonight are designed to support our food service sector over the coming months. We're going to hear from Dr. Herji this evening as to why this order was needed, as well as general update on the state of COVID-19 in Niagara. Well, I know these types of presentations are limited to 10 minutes. Uh, I would ask Council's indulgence to allow the Acting Medical Officer of Health the time he needs to present all of his information. Before moving forward with the Acting Medical Officer's presentation, I would ask Ms. Donna Gibbs, the Region's Director of Legal Services, to provide some legal context on Section 22 and the authorities spelled out in the Health Promotions and Protections Act. Ms. Gibbs. Thank you, Chair. Um, given that um, one of the items that is going to be discussed this evening is the order that was issued by Dr. Herji, I thought it might be helpful to provide um, Council with a bit of context regarding um, the legal framework under which these orders are issued. Um, so a order um, such as the one that was issued by Dr. Herji on November 11th is issued pursuant um, to the legislation under Section 22 of the Health Protection and Promotion Act. Um, under that legislation, the power and responsibility to issue a Section 22 order rests solely with the Medical Officer of Health. Um, the section in part and in essence um, relevant to the discussion today provides that a Medical Officer of Health may make an order under this section where he or she is of the opinion on reasonable and probable grounds that a communicable disease exists or may exist or that there is an immediate risk of an outbreak of a communicable disease in the health unit served by the medical officer of health. That's All right, well, I guess we're going over some legal ease. There's going to be some downtime here. Sorry, Dearborn, did I boot your ass or did you bail? There is a Zoom link. If you're watching on Fakebook, there's a Zoom link underneath. If you want to get in, you want to tell a story, you want to talk about the effects of this, these restrictions on you, your mental health, and your family, I'm down to hear it. Talk to Woodsy a little bit about that. Appreciated his time. There is an interview wherever you're watching it. <laughs> um, there, You can watch that interview as well. Uh, this is going to be a well-attended meeting by the look of it. Let's just see here. How many people we got? 25. Wow. For regional council? That's huge. There's 25 <laughs> watching on YouTube. Hello, silent assassin. Um, that's not to be confused with the six-word assassin who is Ed Duke. Six-word assassin. So it looks like we're live on all the platforms. Um, I will take your participation if you want to come in by Zoom or you can just listen. I'm certainly willing to answer any questions um, as, as the discussion goes on. Uh, thank you very much. I know that a number of members of council were seeking clarification in that regard and you have provided us with that information. I will now call on Dr. Herji for his presentation. This is the COVID-19 status update and recent developments. Dr. Herji. Thank you for being here. Um, I believe this 
meeting was called as an opportunity to have that kind of dialogue, Mr. Chair, that you talked about where we would have a respectful discussion about our disagreements and where we have landed. And I must say that in all of my direct communication with councillors over the past week, all of the communications have been respectful, as you have said, Chair, they have been all along. Obviously, not everybody has agreed with the decision and many have been critical of the decision, but has been communicated in a respectful way. And I'm very uh, you know, appreciative of that. And I certainly hope that that will continue to be the case today. I just want to you know, quickly give an outline of where things are in terms of COVID-19. In terms of the broader global and national and provincial context, as well as here in Niagara, and what were the elements that led to the decision that we needed to institute this Section 22 order and what we are trying to accomplish by it. So to that end, to give you some of the global context, this is really what the daily number of cases of COVID-19 look like on a global scale. And I think everybody can appreciate that that number is rising and it seems to have been rising more steeply as of late. And as we you know, do a quick tour of the globe here, we can see that this is very much the uh, experience of the entire globe. This here is the United Kingdom, which is, of course, has seen quite a sharp increase as well. You see Italy here with a sharp increase as well. And like all other countries, you can see that this second wave is much larger than that initial first wave. Switzerland is another country having a, a sharp increase, and they actually just communicated that their hospitals have now maxed out. And so they are actually no longer able to take in new patients given the number of people who severely ill from COVID-19. Germany was a country that was much lauded as having done an especially good job of managing COVID-19. And we can of course see that they have not been spared from an increase either. Japan, a country in East Asia, which for a long time managed to survive COVID-19 without having to go through a intense lockdown, unfortunately is seeing a large spike as well now. And of course, everybody is, I'm sure, well acquainted with the United States where they've had by far the most cases, the most deaths from COVID-19 and have struggled the most to manage it. So that is the global scale. And of course, in, when you come to Canada, it is very similar again. My clicker seems to have frozen here. Uh, so Canada, of course, you can see we have had the increase in cases as well. Switching to the next slide, I just want to show here that this is some modeling work done by the Public Health Agency of Canada of what they expect is going to come forward in the coming uh, months. And it shows the cases in the, the dots that have occurred through their you know, pandemic through the course of this year. And you can see that there's three lines are showing at the end. And I'll come back to some of the other lines later, but that middle line. All right, I just line, want to get in here. You know what we're now talking about? We're not talking about deaths because, well, it doesn't sell like infections does. Infections make everyone feared. Deaths are way down. When you look in Canada, we are double the infections and a quarter, a quarter the deaths. This guy's not going to talk about deaths. See those peaks over there? Those peaks are twice as big as they were during April, March, and June. Twice the size with a quarter the deaths. No one's talking about that. We understand the disease a lot better than we did when it first rolled in. Let's just see. Hospitalizations in Ontario. And as you can see that there's a growing rate of hospitalizations, which is, of course, going to put us in the same situation as places. And you have to make sure that these are not cumulative. This is not counting the all-time cases that have been referred to the hospital. <laughs> Anyways, why do I feel like this guy is engaging in a propaganda campaign? Don't be scared. You're not going to, you have a one in 10,000 chance under 65 of dying from this thing. <laughs> if you're over 80, be careful. <laughs> you know, 80% of the people that get West Nile virus never know they have West Nile. It doesn't stop everyone from going out and getting all freaked out about it. A spike from a large farm outbreak last week, which has skewed our numbers down, and we are starting to normalize from that. But you can definitely see that even where we've ended up, there's definitely been an upwards trajectory over the last couple of months. Uh, moving to the next slide then. Um, you know, the basis of what we are dealing with in terms of COVID-19 spreading is have close interaction 
it allows infection to spread from one person to the other person. And the entire game that we are playing with COVID-19 is to find ways to break up that interaction between people so COVID-19 can no longer spread. And of course, the two meters distance is one way to do that. Putting barriers between people, such as a plexiglass is a way to do that. Face coverings is a you know, way to get partly there as well, not quite completely breaking the interaction, but certainly making it less intense. All of these are different ways of where we can try and do this. And part of this is, of course, also changing our social behaviors in society so that we are not interacting with people so that that opportunity for infection to spread no longer exists. If we move to the next slide, I just want to give some <coughs> examples of how COVID-19 spreads in real life. And so this is an uh, infographic put up by Ottawa, and they put up quite a few of these, and we hope to do some similar ones in Niagara as well. But what you can see here is you start off with a sports team played, and there's actually one person with COVID-19 who happened to play in that sports team. That led to 10 people in that sports team becoming infected. And as you can see that those individuals variously brought it into homes, brought it into another sports team, brought it into a workplace. From there, it spiraled into other locations. And you see this chain of infections where from one venue, it transfers to another venue, spreads, transfers to another venue and spreads. And that's really the way that COVID-19 tends to spread. There's a lot of discussion sometimes about super spreader events and we'll have this one setting where many people get infected. Those are actually quite rare that we have a super spreader event. Really, this is a more typical example of what happens with COVID-19 is that you have a, you know event where a small number of people get infected, but all of those people branch out and spread it to their social circle, who then spread it out and spread it to their social circle, and it snowballs from there. If you move to the next uh, graphic, uh, this is you know, another example here. In this case, there was a wedding event. Unfortunately, one person had COVID-19. It then spread to affect many different households. From there, it got into schools. Uh, you can see that uh, there's a group home affected as well. And for that school and group home, they have that red circle with the exclamation mark signifying that that actually led to outbreaks at the end of the day from just a simple wedding. And this wasn't necessarily a wedding where people weren't following the rules. Nonetheless, be the virtue of the people are congregating together, there's an opportunity for infection to spread. Going on to another infographic, you know, a very similar type of thing here. Extended family got together in a cottage for a few days. Unfortunately, infection spread amongst them. It spread through many households. From those households, it spread through workplaces, through other settings, infecting many more people. On the next slide, we have yet another example here. This time there was a park party, so people gathering outdoors where presumably it would be safer. Um, we've gone back. You know, one person again had COVID-19. That unfortunately led to the snowballing of infections that ended up affecting two schools uh, with many, many children being forced to send, being sent home because of that and many individuals getting sick as a result of that. You can see that there's one workplace here where it seems, you know, a very large number of people became infected. Uh, switching to the next slide then, you know, this is an example, of course, we had in Niagara and some people have uh, mistakenly described this as a super spreader event and this is not actually a super uh -huh. spreader event so much as it is another example where there's a gathering of uh, people, small gathering, infection spread to them, they all went out to their different social circles, infection spread some more in those circles, it went off to another round of social circles, etc., and it spread through there. And in this example, we've highlighted, of course, the number of contacts that came out of that, as well as the number of different settings that were affected. We have bars and restaurants, we have retail locations, we have sporting locations, we have people visiting family and friends, and all of those exposing others to COVID-19. And of course, most worryingly is that it led to two long-term care home and retirement home outbreaks because these individuals who did become infected through this chain of transmission got into long-term care homes. One last example is an infographic that we put out uh, couple of months ago here. And this, you know, I think very much shows that, you know, at a funeral, a couple of workplaces, a sports game, people coming together from many different uh, parts into a social circle. And from their infection spreads, they take it back and through their other activities in different workplaces, going to that sports game, they end up spreading it to many more, affecting many different pockets of our community as a result. So breaking up these kinds of social interactions is really the whole goal of trying to spread the spread of COVID-19. No, and wrong, course, wrong. Keep your, keep your distance, clothes. wash your hands. You want to wear a fucking mask, go ahead. It's not going to help, as we've seen. Can't stop everything, dummy. Everybody should stay home. And of course, everybody's staying home. 
None of those lines to those funerals. No, that's work. bullshit. You know what? There's more people getting affected by staying at home, you loser. Among group of people in their home. And it basically died out because of that, unfortunately. Oh, it no, it didn't. We're wearing your masks. We're staying at home with social distancing and we're washing our hands. And guess what? Infections are double the first wave. Donkey. And we're seeing COVID-19 spreading once again. And so if we go on to the next slide, you know, we start to see what is the reaction of many people around the world to how do we get these really sharply rising growth of cases of COVID-19 down. And the solution that many countries are choosing is to really go back into that lockdown we experienced in March and April. Europe, after two months of trying to get a handle on COVID-19, was unable to do it with piecemeal measures. And so many countries now have gone to COVID-19. And I showed you what the trajectory in many of those countries were and why that became a necessity. Moving to the next slide and looking at what's closer to home here, we're starting to see that discussion occurring in Canada as well, with many experts recommending that Canada now, and Ontario particularly, need to go back into a lockdown to deal with COVID-19. And if you can click again, I have a couple of quotes here pulled out from what some individuals have said. Um, if you click again here, sorry, if you click forward again and then click once more. This is one of the quotes from that article where some doctors, politicians have proposed implementing circuit breakers two-week economic, economic lockdown to bring COVID-19 under control. Public health experts push for tighter restrictions with some arguing that even two weeks wouldn't be enough. If you click again, another quote from that article, this time from Dr. Andrew Morris, who is a physician and infectious disease specialist in uh, Toronto. I think we need to understand that we need to drive the number of cases dramatically down. That's gonna take weeks and weeks of lockdown any other approach leads us to repeated waves of infection. If we, you know, flip to the next slide, you know, we see some of the discussion more here in Ontario with Premier Ford saying uh, that we are facing down the barrel of another lockdown. If you click, we can see his full quote there. And then one of the responses here from a physician epidemiologist, if we click again, is that they're saying that, well, actually, no, we're not looking down the barrel of a lockdown. A lockdown's inevitable. So this is a context that we are facing right now. Now, for the record, I do not agree with some of these experts that we need to go into another lockdown, at least not here in Niagara. But I think the trajectory is clear that we are headed in that direction and we need to take action now to make sure that we don't end up in a situation where that occurs. In places like Toronto and Peel, the, I think the discussion is becoming very active around a lockdown where they no longer have the capacity to do anything else to manage COVID-19 because the numbers have grown so large. And that's what we are trying to avoid here in Niagara so that we can avoid the real pain and suffering that came from that in the earlier part of the year. If we flip to the next slide, you know, the province is of course trying to take that balanced approach as well. And of course they put out this framework of multiple colors and multiple levels of what could happen where you slowly ratchet up uh, restrictions on social interaction society to hopefully control COVID-19 with lockdown being that final measure. And I totally agree with this being the rough framework that we want to be following. You know, yellow region largely reflects what we used to have with stage three. The red one reflects stage two. A lockdown would be something closer to stage one or earlier, which was, I think, the previous framework the province used. This is really just elaborating on it away. So, of course, we have seen rising cases for a couple of months in Ontario. And if we slip to the next slide, we can see what has been the experience in Ontario of actually trying to get that done. And actually, sorry, before I go to that, just want a, a few more comments that province put out in terms of this framework. The idea, of course, they wanna be responsible and flexible to the latest data. And so they're gonna be adjusting color ratings every week. They note that they wanna introduce preventive measures early to limit the spread of COVID-19 while keeping schools our most vulnerable and our businesses open so that we pay a little bit more pain early up front to avoid rising numbers and getting into the risk of having those lockdowns later, and hence the multiple levels that we might progress through. And of course, they recognize that every community is different, and so the uh, framework provides some flexibility to allocate resources where they're most needed in this. Uh, but also part of that local tailoring is this, which is that the framework is supposed to support the ability for local officials to tailor restrictions in their communities based on what they are seeing as their local. Remember this too, this is a Ford guy. Ford came out today and said he thought it was ridiculous. I talked about it earlier in the show that this man was being harassed online. What, tweets or harassment now? I heard Laura Yip, 
I'm sure she said threats. I want to see threats. I don't want to see. No, I want to see proof of threats. Because I don't believe that anyone's actually threatened this man or doxed him. Or they said he put uh, his cell phone number online. How easy is it to get somebody's cell phone number? And should you be putting it online? Probably not. I don't know that that happened, though. But this is a Ford guy. Ford came out today in defense of him and said that it was ridiculous and the anti-maskers were driving him crazy. This is a nod about masks. It's about targeting an industry that is not responsible for the transmission of the virus. <laughs> and this guy is not talking about deaths. All they have now are infections. I've got graphs to do if you've been watching this channel and you go to worldmeters.com and you look at the numbers of the first wave were double what they were at a quarter of the deaths in Canada. In the States, they're double the infections with half the deaths. Okay? We're, we're getting better at it. We're getting better. But the fake news out there doesn't want you to know the reality of the situation, which is we don't need a lockdown. In fact, lockdowns don't help. They make it worse. Just like wearing your fucking mask outside. Man, I took a walk down by the lake today. <laughs> I passed two girls going the other way that were walking full speed with masks on. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm not falling for it. I'm not wearing a mask on the lake outdoors. Losers. So it seems like this is this guy is a Ford guy. He's first of all, all this might be for naught because he doesn't answer to Niagara Council. Niagara Council could pass something that says, we demand you repeal this, and he goes, well, fuck you. That's all he's got to say. He doesn't answer to them. He answers to the Premier of Ontario. <sighs> you can't fire him. Fire here, G hashtag. I might have been guilty of using that. I don't call for harm to this man. I think he's a tool. Thank you, Jim Hunt. You nailed it. And you know what? I think Ford is is screwing up too. Just like Trudeau. Trudeau could have shut down flights from China. He could have shut down flights from hot spots. He could have put testing at the airport so that people coming off would get their temperature taken or got screened. But he didn't. Cuomo in the States put infected people in old age homes, our, our most vulnerable. And then he wrote a book about how he destroyed the virus. In the hot spot, ground zero in the States, the biggest epidemic, if you want to call it ep epidemic, I call it the flu, a really contagious one. One that you better stay away. Keep your distance and wash your hands. I had a medical health professional the other day try and convince me that the main source of spread of this disease is aerosol. You catch it through the air. No, wrong. I'm not a doctor. I don't claim to have all the fucking answers here. But dude... The, okay, it might be spread by aerosol, but you're not catching it by aerosol. You, you see what I'm saying? Someone sneezes, coughs, spits, fucking touches something, it's infected. You touch that, you get infected. You, go, you don't get infected by standing in front of someone and them coughing in your face. Well, I mean, you, yes, you could. But who's doing that? The chances of a droplet... <laughs> A, a, a virus scooching along, flying through the air on a droplet of water, the chances of you <laughs> getting sick that way are almost zero. And you don't need a doctor to figure that out. You get it by contact. You don't get it from people 
hacking lugers into your orifices or spraying mist that's contagious into your eyes, nose. Yes, that's how you get it, but it just doesn't happen. And it's certainly not going to happen walking by someone outside with a stiff breeze, fear mongering. No one's okay. We, we need to flatten the curve for 15 days, right? Eight, 10 months later, they're still saying, don't talk to your, fa don't, don't see your family. And what, why we're here tonight is because this man has driven an agenda and plus, oh, you know what? We haven't even looked at his tweets, but I posted all this today. Cruise this man's Twitter account and check his likes. Dude is left wing, far left wing radical. exhausted already we voluntarily largely do that so those lines are broken by people choosing not to go to these social interactions and choosing not to interact with others and ideally they would do it very similar to what the lockdown had where people interacted see what they're doing don't interact with others what the fuck man okay listen here's the here's the he, here's the meat and potatoes and again I'm no expert you want to convince me and show me data that masks prevent the spread of disease? <laughs> show me. There's nothing. In fact, there's way more evidence that they don't work. And I think that this mask human experiment is going to show that wearing a mask is really harmful for you. But go ahead. Wear one. Fuck. Be a sheep. Oh, Dr. Prime Tran. Minister here saying that when you're thinking of seeing people outside of your household, ask yourself, is this absolutely necessary? Really emphasizing that we need to tighten our social contact just to our household. This person also said in January that there was no evidence that it was being transmitted from human to human. Yeah, Dr. Tam. We click again, we can see a statement by the premier on October 2nd when they uh, you know, discussion. isn't it great that these fools are the ones that were flaunting all the rules that they put in place for us and then they traveled across provincial borders to see their long estranged wife and children like there's Justin Trudeau's not with his wife right duh so he spent Christmas and New Year's alone in Dominican, where was he? Costa Rica. It wasn't a secret. Dude wants nothing to do with Prime Minister Cuck. I was going to take Adderall today. <laughs> I decided not to. I don't think I needed it, actually. I was paralyzed when I woke up this morning. I couldn't walk. But then I walked for about an hour, and I'm loose. And now my my office chair is not trying to murder me. I just want to see Mark, okay? This is all propaganda, so you'll forgive me if I talk over Dr. Herpes over here. The quote I have here that's pulled from this article. Because it's all bullshit. Dude, show me. You know what? I'll, I'll, I'll pull up some graphs. I'll pull up the world meters for you. But it's, you're going to have to deal with me flipping back and forth. Dearborn, what do you... The Zoom link is active. I don't know for how long. I have a second one at 5.15 in case it dies. I think I'm good as long as I got one person on it. You, you want to hear this, don't you? I noted that we haven't seen significant spread of COVID-19 in businesses such as restaurants yet. However, we have seen cases when people are dining out together with people who aren't in look, their meetings. Look at the fucking headlines here. Grant LaFleche, Niagara was warned about new COVID wave. Now new outbreaks have and death have arrived. Fuck you, Grant. Oh, man. I don't wish bad on anyone. I tried to bury the hatchet. I offered you my hand. <laughs> And you basically spat in it. And then after I walked out of your offices at the standard, you slammed the door on me behind me like a child. And then went around town telling people I lost my shit and you had to throw me out. See, 
the one thing, Grant, there was witnesses there. Four of them were mayoral candidates at the time. It was a debate, including well, a girl I respect quite a bit running the camera and her sidekick in production. <laughs> This fucking guy just engages in making work for himself and scaring people into conforming and carrying the line. April, what's up? You know what? People don't like the honest, though, because then it turns into me calling people names like cuck or DFC. (laughs) Somebody sent me a meme the other day of Laura Yip. (laughs) I don't know if she was in a bucket of chicken or some shit, but (laughs) the meme was uh, DFC, and we all know what that stands for, and we're going to get our fill of Counselor Yip tonight. Trust me. Oh, my God. I should have taken the Adderall today. I'm going to need it. I'm already exhausted, and it's (laughs) 5.11. Dr. Herpes isn't even done yet. And I'm already gassed. <laughs> I'm, I'm out of content. My passion is waning. I feel like I need a, <laughs> I need a friend. Wow. Fuck. Today is, of course, the Section 22 order, where part of it was asking people to attest that they're dining only with a household or one or two people essential for their physical and mental well-being. And the idea of that is to have one more element where we can nudge people to limit their social interaction to just that household and get to, you know, um, really adherence to that advice that we've been pushing for a time. Now, people may be asking, why is it, you know, restaurants, bars, food service premises, and why not wider uh, other locations? And that really goes down to what we've seen in terms of the local data, of where the greatest risk is. And so if we flip to the next slide here, um, this is looking at a breakdown of our outbreak cases, and I'm going to give some caveats to this. You know, we tried to figure out what was the source of the outbreak and, you know, where did all of the infections go from there? And so what is the source of that outbreak is what we're categorizing here. Now, there's a lot of overlap here. I mentioned, you know, there's two long-term care home and retirement home outbreaks that were caused by actually people that got infected through that young adult social cluster and actually Both of them happen to be at food premises when they got infected. Hey, stupid. Guess who, um, hmm, how do I put this? Uh, Food premises are the only one that are taking contact information and sharing it with the government, you fool. Yeah, you can track workplace. Yeah, you can track farm, social group. Dude, where is the um, long-term care homes? Okay. Uh, (laughs) Oh, So we have a virus that is 99.5 plus percent survivable. And if you're under 65, there's almost no chance it'll kill you or even make you sick. And we're going to lock down an industry that is not responsible, doesn't even have a fraction of the contribution that you need. This is not being, it's not... Food premises are the only ones taking names and numbers of people coming through the door. Hello, they're the only one tracking people and sharing the information with you, you dolt. That's why they're so high on the scale. On this Fuck. Side, of course, we have the young adult social class, which I talked about. And if you can see where people uh, went while they were infectious, it was to bars and restaurants. And, you know, I want to emphasize here, some people have said that, you know, uh, you know, is this, you know, bars and restaurants doing something wrong? This is absolutely not them doing anything wrong. This is unfortunately people with COVID-19 showing up and dining at the restaurant. The restaurants actually did everything right and that there wasn't actually spread from the table where people had the infection to anybody else in the restaurant. Holy fuck. Okay, so we had a cluster of kids that went out to a couple bars. You're kidding, right? You're you're fucking kidding me right now. (laughs) Oh, dude. They will not stop looking for targets to land. Okay, you know what? Young people are stupid. We get it. You can't cure stupid. All right? Fuck. Spread with a sports uh, location. Some spread in people visiting families. Of course, the two long-term care home outbreaks. We didn't have anything in retail locations, and that's probably expected because, of course, people don't have close social interaction typically when they're at a retail location. 
Uh, they're really passing by other customers, waiting in line in a checkout. And so fortunately, there's not that same level of risk as people. They're also not sharing their information with you when they walk in like they are doing at restaurants and bars. The restaurants and bars are the only ones taking names and numbers, unless it's an old age home or whatever. Regular retailers are not taking names and numbers of people walking through their door. and They're not asking for ID, clown. Oh, fuck. I can feel my heart pounding through my chest. <laughs> the next door, of course, was restrictions on bars and restaurants because that's the other places where people have close social interaction. And then the final one mentioned here is some outdoor public spaces where perhaps there's lots of congregation of people or where people are having smoke okay. breaks. You are not catching this that's outdoors. You're not catching this outdoors, kids. You're not getting it outdoors unless somebody sneezes on you. Or you touch something. You're not getting this outdoor. Stop wearing a mask outside. Stop wearing a mask completely. They're not helping. In fact, they're making it worse. Otherwise, well, we would have flattened the curve. Staying home is not making it any better. <laughs> I'm losing my mind over here. What, am I the only one? Yes, I am the only one. I'm the only one. I don't go anywhere. I go to the store. I go to the gas station. I go to Canadian Tire. Like, I don't go anywhere, okay? <laughs> I don't see anyone except my homies. We had a nice jam here the other night. And I'm not scared. I'll wash my hands when they leave. If I'm that paranoid, I'll wash the door handles and the taps. Excuse me. Where'd that come from? I'm not afraid. I'm not living in fear. I'm not buying your mask bullshit because unless you have a fitted N95, those things are useless. And for the people that are wearing those blue one-use masks and got them hanging on your fucking mirror, soon as you touch them, they're done. As soon as you breathe through them, they're less effective. And who knows what the fuck you're breathing through in that shit. Fucking sheep. I'm... Uh, why? I know I'm not the only one, but I feel quite alone. Falling for this West Nile, whatever the next wave is. I'm not scared. It's not going to kill me. I'm a germaphobe already. I keep my hands clean. I'm careful. I don't share the joints or the bottles. I never, I do still kind of kiss on the lips, <laughs> but sometimes you trick me and fucking, I, I get lip kissed with unprepared, not lately, but normally. What the fuck? Is this going to go, he's going on for an hour of propaganda. I really want to make sure we don't allow infection to spread too far so that we're able to keep them open and we don't end up where Toronto or Peel or York or Halton is where they're starting to look at even more stringent restrictions and in, uh, in lockdown. And finally, of course, you know, when I'm thinking about the health and I'm thinking Finally, about my favorite slide, words from here, G. Fine, and finally? And this next slide will show what we've seen over the past few months in terms of deaths from COVID-19. And we can see... Finally, uh, now we're talking. Bring up the slide. You know, Cumulative? Since we've gone into that second wave in October and oh, for November, fuck's uh, sakes. just back there, we can see we have seen the sharp increase of deaths from COVID-19. As more cases in the community means more Ten. cases get to our vulnerable. Ten. Ten. And of course, Ten. Be, you know, a little over sharp increase. Show us the fucking March, April. Ten. Ten deaths. And start to prevent these deaths. <laughs> We would have had 30 from the flu. <laughs> Nobody's even getting a cold now. <laughs> 10 deaths. What is, you can see the spike. Oh my God. Stay home. Don't, don't love your neighbor. No, rat on your neighbor when you see him out without a mask. Rat on your neighbor because you saw him at a restaurant with someone that didn't live with him. Who wasn't a real. You know what? When I'm rolling, I'm rolling with three mental health support people. <laughs> no, they don't live with me and fucking <laughs> I have not been I've not okay, I yeah, you're you're right. And advice are pretty useless, but they yeah. They need to be fitted also. But 
I am the only guy I see out anywhere without a mask. You are in one, in my experience, you are in 100% compliance with something you've done no fucking research on and you have no idea how not seeing someone else's face might affect your mental health in the long run. Especially for my boy Sandor, who's been against this from the beginning. And Sandor, I got to give you props. I went to hear G's likes today on Twitter and it's ugly. Sandor was the guy that was scraping the shit off the floor at Shoppers Drug Mart, We're made a big deal. Protecting our um, businesses. Loss of liberties. You're begging government to take them from you and then thanking them when they do. And you don't even know. Just research masks. The effectiveness of them protecting you from a fucking virus. Idiots. I am so. See, I didn't need Adderall today. We have uh, members who wish to ask questions. Uh, who do you think's first? Please, uh, indicate electronically on the screen. If, uh, and the questions can go to Dr. Herji or to Ms. Gibbs, either one. Uh, primarily to Dr. Herji, but uh, there's one that has a legal aspect. Uh, Ms. Gibbs is uh, prepared to answer those. So the first person is Councillor Redekop. Unmute yourself there, Councillor Redekop. <laughs> thank you very much, Chair. Um, I want to thank Dr. Herji for the presentation and the information that he's provided to us. I think we all agree that Redekop needs to unmute. No, I am unmuted. Can you not hear me? I you can are hear now. you. You're fine now. Wow, yep. what a clown show. So, um, let me start all over again. <laughs> I want to thank Dr. Herji for his presentation and for the information. This is entertainment, man. That we don't want to um, have this flame go any higher. Um, I'm not a doctor. I'm not an infectious disease expert, and I'm pretty confident that there aren't any on any of the local uh, councils in Niagara. Nor do uh, you need to be. Um, leaders in our community, and and we need timely information. So. I guess my concern, Dr. Herji, is that you've now provided us with um, some information that uh, sheds light on how you reached the decision to mm -hmm. impose a Section 22 order. Why is it that we would have to have a special council meeting in order for your Board of Health to obtain that information so that we can at least explain to the public when we're approached about it why the order was made? Dr. Herji. So, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm pleased that the information was helpful to the councillor. I would note that most of the information, almost all of it, is actually information that's in the public domain. So it's not really information that I'm providing much, I think, beyond a couple of graphs of our latest cases in Niagara, as well as that pie chart of how we've categorized some of our outbreaks. Now, my assumption, and I think it is perhaps a wrong assumption, was that people were seeing the same information in the public domain and understanding the same risk that we were facing. I certainly take it as feedback that perhaps that needed to happen more. I did try to communicate some of this in my email to counselors in advance of the Section 22 order going out last week, but certainly take it as feedback that perhaps there needs to be a forum to provide this information and synthesize it for all members of council and not just rely on already being out in the public domain. Thank you very much, Councillor Herji, but the most important- Councillor. Slide Not Councillor Herji, doctor, was the pie chart, dumbass. Because that at least puts into perspective why uh, rest food uh, premises would have been targeted by the um, order. And so that is information that we need, and we need it on an ongoing basis. And I, I think it's a little um, unrealistic to expect that, that those of us who have lots of information that we're trying to filter through on not only COVID-19, but many, many other issues are going to be um, going through um, the public health website on a daily basis and analyzing each of the pages that you've got plus the sub pages, et cetera. We need concise information that provides us with the data and the explanation as to why a uh, Section 22 order is made. And if, if you make another Section 22 order, I would hope that you'll provide that information to us 
well in advance because we're looking to public health uh, for your advice. <coughs> We've been trying to follow public health guidelines and the provincial emergency orders oh, oh um, faithfully because we're not the experts, you show. are. But when we are asked to defend decisions that are made, um, it's helpful for us to have that data. Um, the other question that I had was in view of the pie chart, has there been any consideration given to issuing orders with respect to the farms or the long-term care homes? Dr. Hergy. So, Mr. Chair, um, you know, so Mr. there Chair? have been several farm outbreaks. So, Mr. In Chair, um, I'm just like gonna, um, Mr. Chair, uh, so... Many times relied on a Section 22 order, depending on what the situation is. And so, you know, I can say that there have been many other Section 22 orders issued in certain circumstances where it's been warranted. This is, of course, the first one that has had such quite, you know, wide public impact where we communicated it to a much wider audience as a result. Um, you know, I certainly also take the feedback from the mayor of the kind of information that perhaps the mayor would like to be seeing going forward, and we'll take that under advisement to hopefully provide on an ongoing basis. Thank you very much, Dr. Hirsch. And I think it would be also helpful if there have been other Section 22 orders issued, um, it would be helpful if, if those could be highlighted for, um, for the council again, so that if we're approached by those individuals or businesses that are in that particular sector, we can at least provide some information. The other question that I wanted to ask, are there, um, are there supports that would be of assistance to you in, uh, in, in being able to um, ensure that the orders that you issue, including the current Section 22 order, are being complied with? And I know that uh, the local area municipality bylaw enforcement people, the region's bylaw enforcement people, um, are, are trying to pursue these orders as well as the provincial. Um, okay, emergency. so. I appreciate this guy, but new cases in Canada. All right, here we can see over here the height of the first wave. I'm calling it, let's call it two grand. Let's be generous, okay? It's around 16, 1700 and through here. You see, 17, 1800. Let's call it 2000, okay? These are daily new cases. Over here, right now, let's call it four. Let's call it in the fat part right in here, the flat part. Let's call it four. Let's call it double. 2,000 here, 4,000 here. This is world meters. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist, but look at the deaths in the first wave. Now, they don't correspond completely to the dates. You'll see that the wave starts, right, uh, where's the height here? May 6th up here. Yeah, well, May 6th, they do kind of correspond. My bad. But down here, Canada, deaths. Let's call it the fat part, 60. <sighs> down here, 175. 60. Double the infections. A quarter the deaths. Can we just fucking take a little bit of credit for doing something right? <laughs> Even though we didn't close the borders? Municipalities, as you know, some of the bylaw officers. We should have closed the borders. We should have closed the flights to China right away. We should have provided protection for people coming out of the airport by testing them or taking the temperature or I don't know contact tracing them whatever quarant make sure they're quarantined we could have done a better job there we could have closed flights from europe when they were a hot spot we didn't we didn't take care of the elderly we could have pretty easy and now they're committing suicide because they haven't seen their family in 10 months doesn't have symptoms of covid19 I do think that is getting a little bit beyond what a bylaw officer would normally do. And I have been requesting that the province put in place some dedicated resources to make sure this happens, ideally through the Ministry of Labor. Uh, we're still waiting to see that happens. But if there is a role that local area municipalities could help with that effort, I think that would be the other place where we could see some value from enforcement to getting the current regulations better followed and helping to reduce the spread of COVID-19. That, that's very important, and I appreciate those comments, uh, Dr. Herji. 
in Fort Erie as an example and perhaps in other municipalities. Fuck this, this, oh, sorry. This meeting's going to go way late. It's 5.30 p.m. EST. Mus- Dr. Mustafa Hirji is on his first question. We started this at 4.30. How many counselors are going to ask this guy a question? Anybody going to ask a, a hard question? Is Diodati going to get in on this mess? I respect Jim. Do I need to preface this by saying we don't always agree? He is a liberal. But Mayor Jimmy D has always been generous and honest with me. I know he's a salesman. I know Jimmy D from before he was mayor, okay? But I like him. He's a reasonable he's a reasonable dude. And I like Redicop. Redicop's a solid dude. That is certainly a concern we're thinking about, particularly since the red zone is actually right across our border in Hamilton and then stretching from there all the way through P.O. Toronto up to York. Uh, you know, that is all one big swath of the red zone now, and it's right on our doorstep. I think if people are coming from Peel, or say, just to take an I example. I think if people are Peel, coming, my, do we have to sound like a 14-year-old? We have Peel. Laura Yip for that. The risk is actually going to be concentrated at the table that they're sitting. And so I think if we get good adherence to what we are requesting in the Section 22 order to get people to dine together just at one table, I think all the measures that restaurants have put in place really prevent the spread from that table to any other table, to staff, among staff. And so I think the Section 22 order will actually help us achieve that objective as well, so that people maybe come from out of region, any risk will be concentrated amongst the table that they're at. When they leave the region, they will take the risk away with them. If they are forced coming down here and you know meeting up with friends and having more than just their household at that table, of course, now we're going to have Niagara residents potentially exposed to COVID-19, and that will be the risk, and that's hopefully what the order will help prevent. Thank you. And this, the Section 22 order that's currently in place, does that have a horizon or a review, periodic review period? So, Mr. Chair, that's an excellent question. There is a sunset clause that we've put in place for January 1st. That being said, we are going to continue to be watching the data of what happens. Should we see a very sharp downturn of our cases in COVID-19, we would see that as reason to start to lift restrictions in Niagara, and the Section 22 order would definitely be one of those options for lifting those restrictions. The other part we'll, of course, be seeing is, do we see an impact from this order? Or are we heavy-handed? Whoa, unnecessary. And um, you're killing local business, doctor. Doctor. Uh, it's not working. Say to the restaurant owners, the, the bar owners, the um, food premises. Drum roll, operators, please. Uh, when they say that we've been complying with all of the rules, it's unfair for you to be putting us in this position um, when those who are offending uh, are, are facing no, no further uh, penalty in terms of the effect of your order. Mr. Chair, I have to agree with what our, you know, business colleagues are saying. By and large, from what we've seen, they've been doing the right thing, which means infection is not spreading among staff in their establishments. It's not spreading from staff to patrons. It's not spreading between tables of patrons. The spread of infection Bingo. is all about people at a table. Full stop. People are going to be. That's all that matters. They're not then release them, them from your draconian lockdown, doctor. It's unfortunate that people have continued to dine with people outside of their household. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We get it more at home. Service operators are really victims here. And, you know, it's unfortunate that people have behaved in the way they have been not following their guidance that they've ended up being bullshit. You can't blame this on irresponsible people going around their going about their normal life, dude, because we're careful. We're not idiots. We're not children, and these business owners are going under, doctor. These businesses were doing anything wrong or somehow responsible for COVID-19. It was a necessary step needed to protect our population and save lives. Wrong. What's happening to our uh, colleagues in the food services industry again here. They're unfortunately the venue where people have close social interactions. And unfortunately, to save lives and protect the health of everybody as well as protect ourselves from having to have more stringent restrictions across the whole economy. 
there need to be additional measures put in place for bullshit what about church can i go to church with somebody i don't live with sit beside them what about uh walmart what about that brand new costco that your government just put up there doctor since you're a provincial guy and you get you only answer to doug ford who had your back today with that kind of relief that they do deserve for putting our health before every, their profits bullshit see put it, this is the sales job right here this meeting for a, a i will not tolerate a man that stands there and says we're putting public health before your profits fuck you that is garbage rigby Oh, thank you, oh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Tim, sure I like Tim. Tim forgets where he's at sometimes in the meeting. Uh, thank you very He'll much. He'll try and make motions when it's not time to make Chief motions, and Tim should know better. Very Mr. Mayor, uh, come on, Tim. A question. Give Probably it to him, Tim. Legal counsel, just for a moment. Uh, as the, we are all members of the public health uh, as board members or whatever, uh, what exactly is our position in when we're dealing with issues such as uh, these uh, actions that you know we're, we're functionary try, uh, trying to uh, uh, work with and and uh, and we apparently don't have any oh, approval you. on this. So what what is our what exact on? position as a member of the public health? What are you talking about? And I mean the counselors. Uh, Ms. Gibbs, yeah. uh, through the chair. So, if I'm understanding the essence of of the question, as it relates to the particular order, um, council doesn't really have a particular position. The order is a function of the statutory role and responsibility of the medical officer of health, and the board of health's responsibility is to appoint a medical officer of health in order to fulfill um, the legislative mandate under the act. Um, however, council is in this instance providing a very helpful forum, I think, for the public and for, for members of the business community to have a better understanding of the reason for the order and hopefully serve to positively influence behavior in order to avoid the need for additional orders. So I think that primarily that education yeah, no, um, and communication piece is the, yeah. is the role of council in furthering the objectives of public health, which this order is seeking to serve. Yeah, I'm also busy so, with the so in fact, we really don't have any function. Uh, whatsoever, as so a member a of the uh, Board of Health, we do have uh, oh, okay. uh, action function as far as that. being a counselor is concerned. Specifically. Well, yeah, I, what, what about him? I don't know. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, through, the, through the chair, I, I lost I, everybody? No, I, 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 I understand. I, I think um, I'm Councillor Rigby, um, what you're saying, and I, I don't disagree with that. Um, uh, the role here is the role of, of Council with respect to providing a forum for discussion. Um, council does not have a role as it relates to the issuance of this order. Thank you. I think that needs to be very clear uh, so that members will understand, people, no. members of the public understand uh, what the real position is here. Uh, Councillor, uh, sorry, Dr. Hergy, uh, there's there's a numbers thing that, that has bothered me. Uh, uh, some, some, I'm sorry, some I wasn't paying attention. Did, did Tim because, forget where he was again? Uh, Tim, I love you, Tim. I hear on media from other parts of Ontario, uh, different numbers uh, being uh, restricted, particularly in red zones. So in Niagara, how many people are we allowing a restaurant to have within its confines? Dr. So Mr. Chair, Niagara is currently in the orange level and what the orange level permits is up to 50 patrons can be in a restaurant at a time, assuming okay. that there is appropriate spacing that you can space them out to every table, two meters from any other patron at another table. The other okay. part of the provincial regulation is, of course, that no table right now can have more than four people during the orange level. That, of course, differs from the red level where there are more stringent requirements in terms of the number of people allowed on premises. Okay. So no more than four at a table, uh, but not all of them uh, are uh, must be members of a family. 
So, Mr. Chair, as part of our order, we, we would require... I know, our, I know our order is, okay. So, uh, I, I, then that's, that's the Niagara region, right? <laughs> Are bars any different? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure I understand the nature of the question around our hours. Well, in ours, our bars, are they any different? Uh, oh, bars. Uh, bars are considered the same as restaurants right now by the provincial government, so no, they would have the same restrictions. Okay. And um, functions that occur either indoor or outdoor, is there a numbers difference there? Uh, Mr. Chair, there is a numbers difference. So functions, I believe, are restricted to 10 persons indoors or 25 yeah. persons outdoors. But there yeah. are some exceptions made, for example, around uh, religious events. I believe there's an exception for weddings as well. So okay. I would need to double check on some of those if that's of interest. Right. That, uh, I appreciate that. So that's Niagara. What Do you know what Hamilton's restrictions are? Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't know all of them right off of hand. Uh, they're, of course, in the red level, so only 10 persons would be allowed into a restaurant premise. There uh, would be some restrictions now to allowing people into retail locations to ensure appropriate physical distance of anybody inside retail locations. Oh, there are a few that. others, which I don't remember offhand. wouldn't have to uh, consult and get back to you. Okay, so Hamilton... Uh, to your knowledge, is uh, more restrictive. Ten people. Ten people on a restaurant premise. And but ours is fifty. That is correct because we are in the orange level, while Hamilton is in the red level, given that they have okay. much higher rates of COVID nineteen. Okay. Um, and uh, so bars are the same, and then the indoor outdoor functions may be similar. Is that correct? Yes, bars are the same as restaurants, and I believe right. the number for an event is similar for red versus orange in terms of 10 okay. indoors or 25 outdoors. Rather than continue this part of discussion, will you provide to us uh, those numbers comparing Niagara, Hamilton, Peel, and Toronto? Uh, Mr. But Chair, I can certainly pull that together. Um, that, that's fine. I don't need it tonight. It's okay. just uh, if you could provide it to us, it, it may be useful in the long run. Because I can tell you that um, as late as two nights ago on national TV, uh, they were talking about what the restrictions are in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're allowed up to 10 people, and there's no restriction on whether they're family or not. And that's, that's difficult. So I, I think we need I would like to know those that piece of information, uh, and uh, and as well as Peel and Toronto, because uh, when we're restricting to four to a table, and they have to be members of the family, that's where you really affect the operation of a of a restaurant. Uh, just as a suggestion, you may want to consider uh, in in helping us perhaps a. Because you mentioned the youth and they and they get together and so on, perhaps bars should shut down earlier. Because I know in my case with my grandchildren, they don't go out till eleven o'clock at night. Uh, and and oh, uh, perhaps, Tim. perhaps if they weren't open, I Tim. Guess oh, the infinite uh, screen is cool. Oh, I love that. Uh, next question. Uh, we get another question when, too. When you are making these very, and I understand they're very difficult decisions, Mr. Mayor. Make. When you're building into your you got, you got to have respect, man. Oh, this uh, feed is about to run dry. I don't know why, because maybe more than one person came in. My meeting is going dead on the Zoom. That's fine. I'll put another one up. I have another one. I'll put it in the comments of Facebook if you want to get in live. All right. Their health outcomes. Yeah. And so... You know, for example, if you harm a business and you affect people's livelihood, that has huge spillover effects into people's health. And so there's obviously a major balancing of what those are in terms of what you may be contemplating to restrict in terms of COVID-19. Okay, thank you very much. I just have one last, and it's really a comment. Uh, I frankly, I think the communication between yourself and, and council uh, is lacking. And I'm not blaming you one bit. 
I think it needs to, it needs to be improved because uh, after all, last Tuesday afternoon, we were in a in a public health committee meeting, and while there was a number of questions, there was no indication. Oh, Tim, Tim's blowing the whistle. He was in a public health meeting with Dr. Mustafa. I can recall that you were you didn't say shit considering changes the next day what the fuck uh, dude and uh tim i love you tim very difficult i think for most council is that the number of emails we're getting on the same system from people who were opposed or against it or other issues and so on you we can lose your email in uh in the numbers that we're having to deal with on, on an immediate basis. Great Sometimes you find point, out about it Tim. Mr. Mayor, stepping up and hitting one out of the park. Way to go, Tim. So I, I, I think we have to improve that communication while we're going forward, and we need to do it very quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, to and the Councilor for those comments. And I'd appreciate any feedback or suggestions that the member has on how to improve uh, communication. Yeah, as well, well communications can be improved by you talking to the health committee the day before you fucking bring down a mandate. Find a way to improve what? That. It's top secret? From the perspective of councillors of what isn't working and what they would like to see would be most helpful to me. Thank, thank you, Councilor. Bullshit. 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 Yep. Oh, these clowns. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, here's Laurie Epp. For your presentation today. Councillor, yep. That email that you sent to all the council last Wednesday outlining... Can you get a mic? Can you get a, a mic? Your decision to issue... Closer to the mic, woman. Um, the first one, though, I think is uh, for legal. Um, through you, Chair, just to follow up a little bit on Councillor Rigby's question um, and to just seek... just just a bit more clarification. I feel like I'm always going for just a bit more clarification uh, with respect to the role of a medical officer of health and a regional council slash health board. Is it accurate to say that there's no motion that can be passed by regional council that can compel Dr. Hergy to rescind the orders that he See? issued? Um, that <laughs> See? In fact, exercising powers given to him by the province under the Health Protection and Promotion Act. Control uh, the message. That Control the message? And this is the message. Clarification on that uh, on that point and his powers under the act. Ms. Gibbs. Through the chair. Yes, that's accurate. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so now, uh, Thank you. Two questions for Dr. Herji. So um, I'm going to ask you this question, and you're going to say yes, okay? Okay. okay. Is that they feel that restaurants are safer uh, because of all the measures that they're taking than what's going to happen with these new orders that have been issued. The, the points that they've made in their discussions with me um, is, you know, this won't stop gatherings. What people will do is uh, order takeout and then just gather in their homes uh, where there aren't any measures around masking, you know, at any point in the, in the experience or hand sanitizing or those sorts of things. Can you uh, speak to, to that as far as their concerns go? So, Mr. Chair, I, I think that's definitely a risk, and I imagine at least some people who would have gathered in a restaurant or a bar to have that social so interaction. Well, we're going to have like people household setting and that are getting together in their homes, and like they're going to be putting people at risk because there's not going to be any masking going on. Send the bylaw officers, and give them. Uh, warrantless access so that they can barge in and you better be fucking armed if you're coming to my place and there's ratios that they calculate of what that is going to be so I do think it's going to have an impact on some people the other you know element I'd bring here is that you know we have observed that through some you know actions by places like the city of Thorold etc in student housing where they were having you know parties and gatherings in the start of September some enforcement actions they took actually really put a chill to that happening. 
And our understanding is that actually a lot of the social gatherings then moved over to the <laughs> food premises because that was now the place. Where they could <laughs> Bullshit. So actually, by listen, this, we put listen, idiot. <laughs> He's so Sorry, full of shit. Yeah, they went out one night, okay? Sandor, much love, man. Ah, uh, man, I appreciate your input into all this nonsense. And I know it's been a long road for you, man. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Down all of their bars and restaurants, and they thought that, you know, definitely around their university campuses, that had a big impact in terms of the number of gatherings that were happening in terms of restaurants and amongst young people and reducing the spread of infection. And so we're certainly hoping that we have that similar experience. Obviously, we'll be watching the data closely to see what evolves and whether the order is working or not. Okay, thank you. And uh, just one other question through you, Chair. Um, because I, I feel like this has not been, um, well, I actually feel like it's been communicated clearly. I think it's been missed by um, a number of people. Uh, people are very focused on that they can only dine with those in their household. And so again, a number of restaurant owners or others in the hospitality industry are saying, oh, so you know, individuals who have been dating for three years but aren't living together now can't have dinner together um, in my restaurant. And I mean, I would argue that the point about one or two people who are important to their mental or emotional well-being would fall um, that people who have been dating for, for months or years. <laughs> well, wait, wait. Anyway, if there happens uh, to be a local reporter that you happen uh, to be seen uh, on uh, with. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, what about for dating? Hello? Uh, to mental or emotional well-being, please. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think that I need to exactly get right fucked. Why we want to I'm talking about me kind of right now. <laughs> there, uh, for people who really, you know, already are interacting. For I'm not looking time. to make love. <laughs> you know, obviously, if you have a couple. Oh my God! This. I hope I'm. Yeah, I am recording this. But this, this is well. All my life shit is. Good. It's out there. So Someone this is what you get. Alone, you know, we don't I'm funny. I don't care if you it's think I'm not. A, you know, Dr. Mustafa. I'm just here for Mark Wood, okay? I support my boy. He's not my boy. I just met him the other day via Zoom. I did a one-hour conversation with him, and he's a stud. He's stand up. I hope he can fucking breathe, slow it down, and be fucking laser on point accurate. You got 10 minutes, Mr. Wood. This is the only reason I'm here. I'm not here to listen to this bullshit. This crap from a bureaucrat, an unelected bureaucrat that is bankrupting my friends. Not to mention ruining their fucking watering hole, which is mental health. Losers. Thank you, Chair, and uh, th uh, Chair, I thank you. For now, this guy I like, Gary Zaleppa. There's the, here is a politician. Negative comments and uh, some of the behavior I've seen in the media is not. Show it, form, show so it to us, really Gary. Appreciate you calling that. Gary, if you, uh, if yeah. if it's out there, so much, uh, for, uh, show it to us. I want to see it. I want to see anyone that docks this guy or wished him harm or told people to go get him. I want to see it because that's bullshit. I don't think it exists. I think that the left tends to use that as, as, as an excuse. The system uh, could allow for a more uh, fluid uh, flow of information that might have assisted us through this past few days in speaking to constituents. Um, so I just will leave you that with that piece of feedback uh, for myself. Um, I appreciate the position you're in. So, uh, uh, you know, it's a, not an easy one, but I think it, it, the information when it comes forward in the public is always more helpful when it's uh, as transparent and out in the open. So um, I'll leave it that. I do have a couple questions, if I may. Um, I have been speaking with many uh, operators in the uh, food and uh, uh, beverage service as well. And uh, what they'll say to me is, you know, they're doing all these things correctly um, and they've had no incidents of problems and, they, and they've really made some big investments and they feel, you know, unfairly targeted. And I, and I think tonight you've really laid it out uh, really well as to what the actual problem is, is this, the fact that even back in October when the province uh, indicated we Fuck, should did I have the wrong mic on? social circles, people have not. And that puts these Why Gary Zaleppa really is a good politician, even though he's a new regional councillor, is he's a businessman and he went up through the ranks in the real estate community. He's a son of a broker. He knows the real estate industry. His father was a broker. 
No, they're not. And he went up through the political ranks of the real estate industry, Aria and Korea. He's wise. He's knowledgeable. He knows process, and he has a fair take on things. Sure. So, Mr. Chair, first off, I appreciate the feedback from the counselor, and we'll, uh, you know, definitely take And that he's connected to the business community. He knows people that are in this industry that are fucking dying right now, literally suicidal and broke. Finding out where they have been during the time where they could have uh, contracted infection, and really trying to follow up leads test people, trying to find where that source of infection was so we can figure out what were the other chains of infection that might have started from that source, as well as figure out where they're, you know, been since they became infected and where they might have spread infection further. And so through that really detailed investigation of where the source is, we've generally not found that retail locations are a place where we see COVID-19 spreading. To the extent that we've seen spread of COVID-19, it's actually been amongst employees and typically actually been with employees when they're on their breaks or they're on their lunch breaks and sitting together and socializing during that time. And that seems to be where that risk of infection spreading is. You know, I think this all comes back to COVID-19 spreads when we have close social interaction between each other, when we are within two meters for a prolonged period of time, probably not wearing face coverings, that's when infection is gonna spread. And the kind of interaction that happens in our retail outlet is People usually aren't, you know, sitting together, interacting, or staying together and having a conversation. They're, you know, walking through, picking up items they're interested in buying, maybe briefly interacting with a sales clerk or someone like that. And they're not having that interaction that's allowing infection to spread. So they actually are a much lower risk premise. Obviously, they're not zero risk, and there's lots that retailers are doing to make sure that their premises are safe from the spread of COVID-19. But by and large, I think the, what they've put in place has worked quite well to prevent that level of spread. The really you know, an issue with the restaurants, bars, and food premises is that they actually have a lot of those similar measures, and that's preventing spread between one party and another party, or between their staff, or between parties and staff. But you can't do anything about the risk of the people sitting around the table without their mask, enjoying each other's company. And that's really what makes food premises so different. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and then just further to uh, the restrictions on the food premises, did uh, your office consider any um, other restrictions other than the one that you identified in your Section 22 report? Were there other options that were on the table? Uh, and if there were, why weren't they looked at uh, rather than what was decided? Yeah, Mr. Chair, so we did just, you know, consider some other options. One was, you know, about uh, restricting dining to only Niagara residents. And we decided that, that was maybe going too far and was unnecessary, particularly if we had people from outside of Niagara dining together at a table together and then leaving, they wouldn't necessarily be spreading infection around. We thought of perhaps having some stronger measures in some uh, places, such as, you know, having something stronger around uh, ensuring replacement pay for employees who have to isolate because they're infected or have been exposed to COVID-19. We decided that would be going too far and put too much uh, difficulty upon our uh, businesses to, you know, go that length. Um, we also looked at, you know, having more than just what? Dude, you're, you're restricting their income. And if you uh, happen to live at 610 CKTB and you have a morning show there, you might suggest that it's the government's responsibility to bail out businesses that you're inhibiting from making a living. How are you going to replace hundreds of thousands of dollars of income with subsidies? Fuck, man. This is an actual radio show host. When did you start or uh, begin contemplating uh, the Section 22 order? At what point in the timeline? Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe it was right at the start of November. I, I can't remember the exact date, but or thereabouts. Uh, you know, we came up with ideas of what we were contemplating, and then a few days after that, tried to push it out through some of our contacts in Chambers of Commerce, Business Improvement Associations, et cetera to get some feedback from the industry on it. And you may have seen the news reports um, that that leaked out and it was known that we were contemplating some of these. <laughs> I guess you talked to the wrong Question. people, eh? Your the Chambers earlier, of Commerce? You that I'm your contract tracing ability is really on the edge of being uh, broken, uh, you know, unable to keep up. What, uh, I guess my question is, how can uh, regional council support that uh, in a more fuller way? What, what, what do you need? And will you get to us with reports to deal with that if that indeed becomes the case? 
Yeah, so Mr. Chair, you know, again, I think similar to my comments to Mayor Redekop, the most important thing we could do right now is to really push the message that people need to limit their interaction to just their household. What makes contact tracing so much- Okay, so wrong again, right? Wrong, because when you lock people down on their house, guess what they do? They transmit more, you fool. <laughs> the data is in. We understand the disease. Wash your hands, keep your distance. Lockdowns don't work. Uh, social circles to just Fuck. the household. That means there's a much smaller group of contacts are following up, and it all of a sudden becomes much more manageable for us to do post some follow up with them. And hopefully that will also reduce the number of cases we have, which of course reduces the workload and the ability to do that. The only other element that could help, I think, that regional council could do would be, of course, increasing our staff available to do contact tracing. And of course, there are budget implications of that. Of course, the regional budget is already in Seriously. quite uh, um, let's hire some more people to chase a fucking bug. This is, this is the left. Uh, I think if you've hired more people, we could, uh, track people more properly. Uh, thanks for allowing me to ask questions. Thank you, Councillor Zalepa. Councillor Valala. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, a statement, um, well, probably a little bit of a longer statement, um, and a question for Dr. Hershey. But firstly, I just want to reiterate what you had said, Chair. Um, I would like to express my disappointment and embarrassment, actually, um, that I felt watching the Premier of Ontario speak today and the questions he was asked about. Amen, um, sister. If, if you want your voice heard, councillors are here to be your voice. Um, or you have the option, as do the speakers this evening, to present uh, to council in a respectful way. So um, I would ask that we all uh, respect the process moving forward. So that being said, <clears throat> my comments are as follows. If any individual um, believes that orders and legislation should be based on a select group of people who break the rules and therefore everyone should suffer, then I can understand. Um, how one could agree with this order. I do not share in that approach. And at the region, we work as a team. And I've worked on teams that work cohesively and come to decisions together after respectful debate and even with differing views. And I've also worked on teams where certain members undermine the work of others and those teams um, ultimately fail. So somewhere in this process, we've lost sight of that. We have to remember that most businesses um, did what they were asked to do to reduce the spread of this virus. They stepped up and they did their part. They did so at their own expense and with little to no pushback. And it is said repeatedly that small business is the backbone of our economy. And I know as a small business owner, the truth in that statement. So then why are we not working together as a team to support them? The rationale of this latest order invoked by public health was implemented without council discussion or debate. Uh, more importantly, the input of any of the individuals that it impacts the most, our restaurateurs and our bar owners. You would think in a democratic society that if government is going to impose restrictions on individuals or business owners, they would at the very least give them a warning and provide advanced reasoning. But instead, often we take this, what I believe to be unacceptable approach of we know what's best for all of you. Uh, they, the public, will just do it. They'll accept it. They'll get used to it. It'll be forgotten. They'll move on. The rest of that, uh, the result of that approach is what we have before us now in the public. That's not a healthy way to govern. And it only causes distrust amongst elected officials or with your elected officials. So if government would ever level, provincial, regional, federal, are going to make decisions that impact the lives of their residents so drastically, at the very least they should do is to be able to back up their decisions with statistics and facts. You've shown us, Dr. Hergy, the breakdowns of the bars and the restaurants, uh, retail, um, the long-term care homes, so I thank you for that. But 
where is the empirical evidence that six people at a table, now down to four only related people, has been proven to make a difference? As a matter of fact, you mentioned no spread occurred within the restaurant, i.e. transmission from patron to staff or to other patrons. So my question is, these people dining together have had many interactions prior, even within that day, prior to getting to that restaurant, including some may have a very close work environment. So that doesn't really make sense to me. I want to make this, though, very crystal clear. I 100% support the safe measures that have been taken by our province and the region to keep the people of Niagara safe and healthy, but it must be based on provable data and stats and justifiable limitations should only be determined after what I believe healthy consultation amongst yourself, Dr. Herji, and your staff and your medical peers, and the presence of sound reasoning followed by evidence to substantiate that reasoning, rather than determined uh, by an edict. Which brings me to my question. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Dr. Herji. The decision you made is well within your legal rights as well as your responsibility as the acting chief medical officer for Niagara. And as we heard from Ms. Gibbs, you did consult with your legal team, obviously, prior to making that decision. What I find extremely concerning is that was, there was no foresight of the possible damage such a decision could cause by not discussing, or at the very least, briefing counsel. Actions such as this erode the trust in the system. A regional council is elected by the residents of their communities to take care of their communities. And I'm here to represent the residents of Welland as well as the residents of Niagara as a whole and the struggles that our businesses are facing. And I'm here to stand up for the things that I feel are right and just and to question the things that I feel are not. And I do do my utmost to present my concerns in a respectful and a dignified manner. So my question, Dr. Hershey, from our discussion on Tuesday, November 10th at Public Health, where I asked a direct question, and you clearly stated that no decisions had been made and you would discuss with counsel. To your decision made to impose these restrictions on Wednesday, November 11th at 5 p.m. was a 24 hour period. So I ask you, and I ask you respectfully, what information were you presented with from 5 p.m. on November 10th to 5 p.m. on November 11th that prompted this quick turnaround, this quick decision? And will you be transparent and share that specific information pertaining to eating with only family members, not general information, not general stats, uh, not, not any of that, specific to Niagara and to our businesses, to the residents of Niagara? And I believe, Dr. Herji, this would go a long way in restoring trust. Thank you. Dr. Herji. Okay, so thank you to the Councillor for lengthy comments. <laughs> On that latter part, uh, since the start of October, you know, of course, through our detailed contact tracing efforts, we have traced back 15 instances where infection is spread because people are dining together at a restaurant or bar. So that is the evidence that we have this occurring. We have not observed that number of instances in other locations. And so that's the answer to that part of your question. Um, in terms of consultation with those affected by a decision, I couldn't agree more with the council that that is a critical element to do. And we did attempt to do that by reaching out through our business improvement association chambers of commerce to get feedback from restaurant and bar owners for what how this would impact them. And did receive quite voluminous feedback, which we did you know, take into account when refining our final term of the orders. I do get the sense though that perhaps that consultation wasn't sufficient and there's many business owners who felt that they were left out of that. And I think that is some feedback that we're gonna be taking away to see how, if this does need to happen in the future, how we can better approach that. And I'd invite our business owners across Niagara to really give us the feedback on how we can maybe do that kind of consultation better. Our approach maybe wasn't the best way going through intermediaries and what would be a better way to get that kind of feedback in the future. Lastly, in terms of the decision-making and uh, at the point of Public Health and Social Services Committee, 
Uh, at the time of the meeting, we had not made any decision to proceed with the order. You know, in hindsight, I think I could have given a better appreciation to council of what was the timeline that we were looking at and how close decisions might have been. And, you know, it was my fault that I didn't do that. And I apologize to council for not having the foresight to provide that level of transparency to them. What happened in those, uh, those final 24 hours was discussions with legal to really refine the terms of the order, some discussions with our communications teams on how do we adjust the terms of the order and do any of them need to be adjusted to make sure it'd be easy enough for the public to understand, as well as a final look at the feedback that we had received from businesses and if any other adjustments need to be made based on that. And so that's what was occurring over those final 24 hours. And ultimately after considering all of that, we felt ready to move ahead with the order. I you know, would again, you know, as I mentioned to Mayor Redekop earlier, would appreciate any feedback the councilor has on how we can improve the communications and have a better experience going forward. Um, I think this has you know, been highlighted as something that has not worked as well as it needs to, and we need to fix that going forward. Thank you, Dr. Hershey. Thank you, Councillor Valala. We now go to Councillor Kiyokio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had the similar uh, comments as uh, Councillor Valala. Um, I, uh, and a lot of questions already been answered, but I, I want to stress, express my disappointment in Dr. Herjee not communicating this with us as well. As co-chair of public health and, and community services, nothing was mentioned to me. Actually, there was a, I had a business owner call me Wednesday evening telling me about the order and, and I was embarrassed by it. Um, so I think communication is a big part. I know Dr. Herjee keeps stating that you know, let's give them some feedback. Well, my feedback is communicate with your co-chairs, myself and, and Councillor Greenwood, because um, I don't feel that we're, we're being informed enough uh, in, in any of these uh, communications regarding the, the pandemic. Um, so I, I, I just want to express my disappointment in, in, in that. Um, Mr. Herge, or Dr. Herge, you stated that, you know, that you you feel for the uh, business owners, the uh, restaurant owners, and that um, um, yeah they're doing everything that they can, and you think that they'll the numbers will go down by this, but it, it doesn't look like it's going to be by a tremendous amount of numbers that it's going to go by. Um, the, the the people are going to find an alternative to this, um, and and from my experience and from what I've seen in, in attending these restaurants in the last couple of months, it's probably the safest place to be. At least it sanitizes. People there are, are wearing masks. Um, they're going to the people are going to start congregating in, in other people's homes. You might even see numbers go up. So I, I don't know if we. I think I think there's there could be better better alternatives to this, um, in my opinion. Um, so I, I I'm, I'm I'm very disappointed. I'm all I. A question to Dr. Herjee. I'm looking, and maybe you can clarify this for me or give me some more detail on it. Exposure locations. I, I'm quite shocked that uh, at the numbers here, that retail is only 23 and bars 41, family and, and home is 12, sports and recreation 17, and long term two. Is this where they contacted? This is where they, they got the virus, or is this just a place that they were at that they could possibly? Uh, been in contact with someone that had the virus. Can you just clarify that that screen for me, please? So, Mr. Chair, first off, thank you to the councillor for the honest feedback. I will take it very much to heart, and I hope that we will improve down the road. In terms of those exposure locations, what that signifies is that a person who had become infected with COVID-19, during the period where they were infectious, where had they gone? And so amongst those 31 people who became cases of COVID-19, those are the sum of all the different places that they had gone. Uh, so, you know, we have the 41 bars and restaurants. Translation, let me interrupt here. Restaurants and bars are the only ones that are tracking information on people entering their doors. Do you get it at the drugstore? Do you get it at the grocery store? At the bank? No. The only place they're taking your information because they've been mandated to unreasonably are the restaurant and bars. So where do the th what do you think the tracking uh, information they comes from? They've, they've infected anybody. There's just more chance of an infecting someone, correct? That is correct. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. 
Okay. Oh, okay that's so we're fucked. Basically, this guy's okay. So, so we're fucked. Basically, so we're here for nothing. We got a special meeting. We're gonna hear from the public, and basically, we are foobard, fucked up beyond all recognition. Dr. Oh, Kirby, I think hello, a counselor. Stop it. And uh, I think we can can you really stop with the yeah. angle? Particular order. Wow. Clavicle alert. Hello. Residents as well as business owners who are feeling very challenged by this. Um, so I'm, I, I do have quite a few questions if you bear with me. Um, you, you've made it clear that limiting social interactions to immediate household is a strategy that was communicated across public health units and is consistent with provincial messaging. Um, have there been other units that have mandated this uh, limitation in restaurants? Mr. Chair, I'm not aware if another unit has mandated similar restrictions on restaurants. What I've seen in other units is that they have focus on reducing the number of people who can dine at a table or to actually just closing restaurants completely. So in other words, the fear of we closing you completely is outweighed by the fact that this has never been done before anywhere, anywhere. Draconian measures. Include immediate family members. Mr. Chair, we have really deferred to individuals to self-declare if they have that sort of relationship. So oh I would really God. defer to two individuals. I'm to suicidal. To um, I'm going to make the suggestion that we we in, we adopt also the language or immediate family members because I think that I think we're trying to capture that. Um, and uh, it may help in terms of um, people who are isolated, who are, you know, following rules to the T, which is great, but, you know, there could be a single person living in a household who now believes that they can't go out and see a, a daughter or a son or a mother who, you know, they really need that, that connection uh, for their mental health and are most likely meeting with them anyway, just not going to do it in a restaurant now. So, um, I'm wondering if you could consider p perhaps modifying that language so it's more clear to people that uh, that wouldn't be a restriction. Is that, would you think that, is that within the advice, consistent with your advice? Yeah, That's yeah, a great Mr. question. Chair, we'll definitely take that under advisement and back to our communications team of how we can. In other words, that. no. Definitely <laughs> thinking about a family member who lives alone and depends on others to not be socially isolated. That's exactly the kind of example that we were contemplating. And we actually mentioned within the language of the order that someone who lives alone, uh, you know, would connect with others to prevent that kind of social isolation. And we also have a lot of community members who help support mm -hmm. um, um, like elderly loved ones. If, right. And it's going to be impossible for them not to yeah. be in touch with them. So I think that, you know, that also captures that relationship. Yeah, and Mr. Um, Chair, again, we mentioned caregivers specifically again in the language of the order, and exactly that's exactly the kind of thing we wanted to capture. You mentioned workplace spread as an area that has been problematic and that we have inspect, inspect, inspectors attending those types of workplaces. I'm wondering if, um, I think there was very strong language around working from home as part of our recommendations that happened at the beginning of the pandemic. I'm wondering if we're seeing workplaces where people are not working from home where there could be and if we could incorporate some of that messaging again just so we're we're reaffirming a strong need to do something different to protect our communities yeah mr chair uh that definitely does remain the recommendation i think at all levels of government of what people should be doing working from home whenever possible to the extent we've seen infection spreading it's really been not in workplaces where that would be an option but workplaces where you know they do have good reason for Ooh, i'm scared <laughs> handling of objects that's needed and so i do think that there's probably still good adherence to people working from home 
Uh, but definitely, you know, within those workplaces where we are, you know, perhaps there are some examples where people haven't pushed the work from home message as best as they could. That's definitely something we can consider pushing a bit more. Um, you also noted that the 20 to 39 year old cohort is seeing the highest number of cases. Are there specific rules we can consider um, <coughs> that apply to, in your um, Clavicle? <laughs> that can directly apply to this group? Like, is there something more we could do to, I mean, aside from a mar marking mm -hmm. <laughs> messaging that can um, maybe place rules on them or somehow get them to uh, be impacted in terms of their social interactions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, it, the council raises a really good question and that's something you've been thinking a lot about as of yet, we haven't really figured out what that is. We've been thinking about, are there kinds of locations where really it's just young people attending and can we do much around that? We haven't really come up with any good options around that. We are definitely looking at social media and targeting to that younger age group and had a quite success in getting, uh, you know, our social media targeted fuck. to that group. So that's one area we've tried yeah. to focus on. But certainly the council We're making videos at the region we could look at for those young kids. Those young, stupid, drunk kids. In your marketing efforts, uh, you're talking about ramping up social media. Will you be engaging with a marketing firm? Uh, Mr. Chair, we haven't necessarily engaged with a marketing firm, but we have bought marketing data. Uh, so we've bought market segmentation data. We've been able to produce profiles of the kinds of people we're trying to reach, as well as what are the kinds of values they hold that you know we can tap into and hopefully resonate with to make it most appealing to them, as well as what are the kinds of themes that aren't going to be as uh, resonant with them. And so we've definitely done that. We haven't necessarily engaged a marketing firm to do the work for us, but definitely have got the information from them. I'm, I'm just thinking maybe somebody. Fuck. Uh, I'm exhausted already. I was exhausted at 5.30. Now it's almost 6.30. And make sure that your, your messaging um, is uh, as effective. Um, as Councillor Hudson, is that your name? You really need to Clavicle Hudson, I mean. Uh, um, I think that. I'm going to assume that council would be supportive of something like that. Yeah, um, of reducing the why restrictions. Why are we promoting the COVID app? Oh, because it's oh my gosh. So the councilor promoting the COVID app quite strongly. In Niagara, oh my god. Are you um, cool on it? Okay. Seriously, are you taking the shot to something that's 99.5% recoverable, like your survival rate? If you're under 65, you got to like what is it? A 1 in 10,000 chance. What a, like come on. You're not taking the shot, are you? You're not taking the shot. There's no way you're taking the shot unless you're 80 years old plus. Then you take the shot. And you take the ch chance that maybe the shot kills you. Well, given that there's so little information that is going to be provided to anybody around it. Um, <laughs> we have so little information that we're just going to enact draconian measures. Lock down our fucking small businesses, force them into bankruptcy, suicide, and alcohol abuse, and domestic problems. Because we think we know so what's best. A notification on the COVID app that says they've come into contact with someone who has COVID. What happens? They call public health and we recommend they get tested? Well, they, they call public health, certainly. We wouldn't recommend they get tested yet because you need to wait a certain amount of time after an exposure to get tested and that test to be reliable. The, app doesn't the tests are not reliable, okay? This test is so wrong so often, and it doesn't even test for COVID. It, <laughs> just look up what the test is. Shit, man. We get so many false positives in this, and they're inflating the numbers, period. They're inflating the infection numbers and the death numbers. Everyone knows that. Everyone's admitted that. Disappointed because um, obviously that's a tool, an additional tool that can reach, especially that cohort that are highly active on their cell phones, um, that can make a dent in this. I think. Uh, Councillor Hudson, there's no one in the demographic that you're talking about that is downloading the COVID app. They don't want you tracking them. Mr. Chair, the app is. Uh controlled by the provincial government and they have taken a 
privacy first approach with the app. So they want it to be absolutely 100% private. And so the consequence of that choice is that there's no information collected that can then be helpful to us in local public health. And mm -hmm. so unless the province makes, I think would be a quite a fundamental shift in what their philosophy around the app is, I don't think we're gonna get that. Okay, you mentioned, did you say that Hamilton is now in the red zone? Mr. Chair, that is correct. Uh, what portion proportion of our um, spread is contributed or attributed to communities that are outside of Niagara? Yeah, Mr. Chair, it's not a very large proportion. If I, I'm, you know, ballparking here, I would say it's on the order of maybe five to ten percent. Five to ten percent. Okay. Um, so we talked a bit about enforcement. I think a lot of council is really interested in how we can better enforce. Is it, do we have something like a snitch line where uh, organizations- No, 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 do not yeah, Mr. Chair, go down the snitch line thing. on our website to give advice around that. If you have seen some organizations- Oh, or no. Rules, it links you to the various municipal bylaw offices where you should send that complaint during the day. Counselor hours, Hudson. you a phone number for the Niagara Region Dispatch Line. You're, you'll then patch that over to the police who are responsible for enforcement after hours. You're exposing your clavicle. If hired some additional uh, bylaw officers, would that help? Oh, uh, Mr. Chair, obviously, yeah, more uh, officers yeah we need more bylaw officers. We know your answer is necessary to whether that that's needed. Uh, deferring. To uh, no, it's needed. Business yeah, office here you need in Niagara, it as well as the local. Uh, see the way he's placing his hands. This is a well rehearsed speaker. I'm just saying. Um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Chief McCullough is on the line as well. Chief I McCullough. Know he wishes to add anything uh, to the matter that you have raised. Uh, Come on. Chief McCullough, do you have anything to add? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and through the councillor. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, we look to work closely with uh, our bylaw enforcement uh, units across the uh, Across the region, and um, I, um, you know, wow. I, I know from our okay. from ourselves, Turn we have down. competing priorities. Oftentimes, uh, during the uh, night hours, when uh, oftentimes these types of calls are coming in, so it, um, we would certainly be, we would benefit from having additional resources. But I understand the uh, the resource challenges that municipalities may be having. Thank you. Our, our manager of business licensing is also on the line. Would he like to add to anything that has been said? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh, and, and I uh, concur, the enforcement resourcing we have is uh, uh, between the region and the, the, the local municipalities uh, is, is effective at this time. Uh, we are looking at other methodologies, but uh, I think we're in good shape. Okay, thank you for that information. Um, Dr. Herge, I think, I think the point that maybe is, uh, gets counselors upset in terms of the communication is the idea of um, being surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if there is an initiative that you're considering adopting that you think will help reduce the spread further, um, it might even be good to hear that it's something you're considering in an effort to try and get people to comply more uh, diligently with uh, the public health measures as a as a way of preventing us from taking further more um, severe action uh, such as the section 22 order so certainly you know reducing those surprises would certainly i think make us feel a lot more comfortable in terms of knowing what's coming and um, yeah, that's the only suggestion I can give. And, and, and one final question is, uh, what scenario would we have to be in for you to consider a potential lockdown? So Mr. Chair, um, I think a lockdown decision would go well beyond what we would decide locally. And that would be a decision by the province. They haven't put out their metrics yet, but I imagine it's gonna be 
some combination of having gone into the red level and the combination of those measures plus anything done locally has not shifted a, a trajectory of increasingly rising cases. Seeing our hospitals start to get filled up and being at risk of no longer having the hospital capacity to deal with more cases of COVID-19, as well as seeing public health capacity overwhelmed and no longer able to follow up with cases. I'd imagine there'll be some combination of that that the province would use, but that is my speculation. The province hasn't released their metric yet. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Houston. Councillor Foster. Houston, Houston. What did I say, Hudson? Thank you, Councillor Houston. Houston, we have a clavicle problem. We, uh, we're quite clear on communication, and and I appreciate um, that. I'm not going to jump on with that. Uh, you you've acknowledged that we have to do better in that area. Uh, I want to talk briefly about uh, the item that Councillor Zalepa hit, and that was uh, on the provincial metrics and the fact that um, you've stated within the diagram that our capacity is almost overwhelmed. And by the way, that means to me um, kind of the same thing as, okay, I arrived on time, so you know I'm still there type of thing. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, mm. is there a major concern on your part on the capacity within the system? And the reason is, and I'll go into it with my second question, but um, this is one area that we can affect. This is one area that regional council, this is very important to us. Um, and so my question to you then is, do you have major concern in this area? And if so, um, what would you like regional council to do about it? Yeah, so Mr. Chair, this is definitely an area of major concern. If you go on our website in the reopening tab of our website where we have metrics around how we are tracking with COVID-19, we put out our data on how our case and contact follow-up is. And this week, again, we were fortunately able to reach 100% of our cases within 24 hours, but you'll see that our contact metric is I think around 86%, so less than the 90% metric, which the, we were trying to reach. And even after 48 hours, we had not reached 100% of them. And that's a symptom of us being stretched to the point where we can get still to our cases, but we're not getting to all of the contacts on that timely basis that we need to. You know, as I mentioned to you earlier, the biggest thing that would help with our contact tracing efforts is if people start to limit their social contact to just their households, because that reduces the number of contacts and makes it possible for us to actually get to everybody within our resources. And it'll also lead to fewer cases down the line, which will mean that we start to have plentiful resources to do that follow-up again. So that's the biggest thing. If we can continue to push that message and amplify that message, I think that would be the most helpful measure to take. The other one I talked about is in terms of resourcing, and that'll be something that we talk a bit more about once we come to the budget discussions. Uh, we have been hiring additional temporary staff to bring them on board to help with this. We have done lots of redeployment. Most public health programs actually have stopped operating as we redeploy those staff to working on COVID response. There is a time lag though, whenever you hire someone that there is an extensive period of training and building up their skills to do this work. And so, you know, if we have a sudden jump of cases, say in a week from now, we can just deal with that by having more staff come on board. You know, obviously it's something we would like to plan for for the rest of this pandemic, but the biggest thing is for people to tighten up their social circles and have fewer contacts and really amplifying that message. So uh, through you, Mr. Chair, so it, just a, a quick comment on that. Um, uh, we can't wait for the budget process. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you've stated and others have stated that things are changing on a day by day, week by week basis. So, um, you know, I, as a counselor mm -hmm. on this council, I, I really want you to be telling us I have concerns and make sure that we know and understand that so that, you know, we can make the decisions that have to be made to help you do your job. So um, question to you sort of following up from that, mm -hmm. because um, there's hundreds of restaurants in, in Niagara. Okay. I mean, you know, and, and thousands of people are, are, are employed within this. So my question to you is, is this maybe another piece of the puzzle as well on, on how we're able to trace things? Like, so for instance, let's assume a particular restaurant owner has not followed the rules and we've ended up with illness coming out of that. How quickly do we know that? Um, what, what happens if, um, 
you know, like the overwhelming majority of restaurants in Niagara have not had mm -hmm. um, uh, issues with this. I, I'd be willing to bet you in the neighborhood of 95 to 98 percent of all restaurants have not had any issues in these particular areas. So, so you know, was there other potential um, ways for us to go and approach this? Um, you know, including gearing up our our uh, our staff to go and look at these things further. This is just a curiosity question through you, Mr. Chair. Sure. So, Mr. Chair, to the first part of that, in terms of how quickly would we realize? Typically, COVID-19 is probably around at least five days before someone, after they've been exposed, develops symptoms, build a few days for them to go get tested, we getting the result. It's usually at least a week later that we find out that there might have been something. And usually it's a few days more before we've got two or three people linked to that same place in that same location to make us feel that we need to go investigate. So that time would be, you know, a week, 10 days before we would find out that the location is a particular concern. Sometimes it can be longer. We are seeing a pattern that some people are getting mild symptoms, a runny nose, and they ignore it and don't get tested until things worsen over the course of several days. And that, of course, then delays that whole chain and we find out things maybe two weeks, two and a half weeks later. So that's an issue around the timeline. Uh, just want to emphasize that by and large, when you go follow up with those premises, there's, they haven't done anything wrong. It's that the people have been together with others who happen to have COVID-19 at a table. And so that's something at a restaurant obviously can't control what happens at that table. And so I just want to highlight that, that we're not generally seeing that restaurants are doing something wrong. It's the people who are going out which and dying. exactly why you need to call off the dogs, doctor. In terms of the, restaurants uh, are not the problem. Question, That's why. Which was in terms of the volume Fuck. of numbers. You know, I think it's Filthy mouse on me. to recognize that what we try to do in Canada is try to keep the... Can we get rid of this clown? Because he's just propagating fear and justification for your liberties being ripped from you. And if you think it stops here, you're wrong. This goes way past this. It's just the test. Just a test. The freezer trucks in New York, if you remember those images. To that end, if you think about the total number of... Freezer trucks? Is he talking about the images of the... <laughs> Our hospitals are not overwhelmed, doctor. So COVID-19 is rare, you know, and so you'd expect that the vast majority of restaurants would not be, have been impacted by it just because of that. The problem is that as it does spread, we are seeing it get into long-term care homes. And when it does get to those individuals, we do start seeing deaths. You know, I've mentioned that since the start of October, we've unfortunately seen 17 deaths from COVID-19, and those could be prevented if we didn't have as much infection. The average age of death, what is it? 80 years. The average age of death is 80 years old. A average. I've all the way along with, with this process been a supporter of doing what's right for the health of our community type of thing. So um, I'll be interested in some of our motions that we're bringing forward later this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Councillor Nicholson. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair, to uh, Dr. Herji. I'll be brief. Uh, many of my questions have been answered. Uh, Dr. Herji, these are challenging times. With you know, with these challenging times come come challenging uh, decisions. So I, I can appreciate the pressures um, and the balancing of interests um, with your decisions. A couple questions. Um, you mentioned that you did consult the community, and you mentioned earlier that you consulted BIAs and uh, Chamber of Commerce. And so I, I was happy to, to hear that because that was one of my questions. And the follow-up question I had to that was, did you get feedback from them? And, and was the feedback supportive of this household dining restriction that was imposed in Section 22? Yeah, Mr. Chair, we absolutely did get quite a bit of feedback. Okay. I'm not sure I'd characterize anybody as being supportive of it, and I wouldn't expect any bar or restaurant to be supportive of any limitations on their business. I think there's a mixture of there's definitely someone who are unhappy about it, about understanding, and gave us feedback on what would make, you know, putting such an order in place, you know, less harmful on them. For example, one of the bits of feedback that came is that they wanted this to be turnkey, that we put out resources, we put out data collection forms, so they wouldn't have to do that work that it could just be kind of take it off the shelf and they could run with it and that would ease some of the additional burden. And so that's one of the things that we took into account and on our website, we have those kinds of forms and resources available to them. 
There was, of course, though, then obviously a group that was quite opposed to this and articulated how it would really harm their business. And we definitely took that into account and weighed that into consideration of the need to go ahead with this. Okay, uh, and you mentioned um, other jurisdictions. There's other jurisdictions that are in orange and uh, yellow zone. Um, in those jurisdictions, has the medical officer of health um, imposed such a similar restriction on uh, household dining? Uh, Mr. Chair, nowhere else, I believe, have they imposed a similar restriction. In okay. both Toronto and Peel, they've you know had Section 22 orders recently imposing much more onerous restrictions on many different sectors, including closing all indoor dining. Uh, okay. In Middlesex, London, they also have a Section 22 order against bars and restaurants with some different measures in place. And, and when I look at Section 22 under the mm -hmm. Health Protection and uh, Promotion Act, one of the requirements is that the medical officer of health have reasonable probable, probable grounds that the order is absolutely necessary. Um, and, and I believe it has those exact words, absolutely necessary to reduce um, the risk of spread of this virus. Um, or, or and or to eliminate this virus. Um, am I reading that right? Is that your belief that this household dying restriction is absolutely necessary? In other words, if we don't if we don't have this restriction, we're not, we're going to be unsuccessful in reducing uh, transmission of this virus. So, Mr. Chair, I, I, the wording does not include the word absolutely. It's just necessary, but it does okay. include the language of reasonable and probable grounds, which is actually a legal standard that we have to meet to have some, you know, high level of confidence that the measures are necessary. And of course, you know, that was one of the top considerations before we move ahead with such an order like this. We, you know, wouldn't go ahead and do that uh, without adequate consideration of that. And we absolutely do think it is necessary. And we tried to narrowly tailor what's in the order to what we thought was necessary. So, in your, so what you're saying is if we did what other jurisdictions are doing uh, in the orange zone or other jurisdictions in the yellow zone, with the exception of the few that you, mm -hmm. few regions that you mentioned, that would be insufficient here in Niagara. That's, that's your belief? Mr. Chair, that is indeed my belief. And I think all we have to do is look at trajectory of cases of places like Hamilton and Halton and Peel and Toronto, where putting in the restrictions the province imposed were not sufficient to stop that spread. Okay. And since the day that this order came out, I think it was last um, Thursday. And after that, after your Section 22 order came out, the province uh, move Niagara from yellow to orange. Is that correct? I think it was last Monday. Is that right? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. So, so we actually distributed our order to our businesses shortly after notifying council on Wednesday evening. We okay. went public with it on Thursday. Uh, and then, yes, the province announced on Friday as, as a surprise that they were shifting the thresholds in their framework, which meant that Niagara would now be in the orange level, and that took effect on Monday. And I noticed in your original order, you had limited dining to six people per table. And I believe when the province moved Niagara into the orange zone, we were then moved to four people per table. Is that correct? Yeah, Mr. Chair, that's correct. We had used six people per table to align with what were the rules in the yellow level. And the province, of course, has now superseded that by moving us to the orange level. And does that impact your um, thought process when it comes to the fact that now we restaurants are limited to four people per table, does that impact your thought process as to the this being essential, the, that tables be limited to households only? Yeah, Mr. Chair, so that's actually the very first thing we thought about on Friday afternoon when we saw the province had moved us into the orange level. We concluded that yes, I do believe it is still necessary because the core element we're trying to get to is people interacting with others beyond their household and having that close interaction at a table. And, that I don't think was really addressed by anything the province put in place in the orange level. And one of the restrictions talked about the mental um, or emotional well-being. I was happy to see that that exception in there. Um, biz restaurant owners or business owners, they might have questions as to, you know, what does that mean? How, how is that interpreted? Or they might be asked those questions from patrons. Um, are they to, to give an interpretation to the patron or are they, are they to say, contact the region or contact someone else? How would you, how would you recommend that be handled? Yeah, so Mr. Chair, there's of course the public health information line and we have a dedicated line for businesses looking for guidance so they could always call us for that. Ultimately, our goal here was that we wanted to def 
defer to the patrons to make that determination because we weren't going to be able to think of every possible example out there. And so we're putting our faith that our citizens are going to be responsible and are going to, in a good faith effort, you know, define who is uh, critical for their physical and mental health and who isn't and declare accordingly. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Jordan. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, through you to Dr. Herji. Um, uh, I understand that, that safety is the, the most important issue, obviously, and, and you wouldn't take um, putting a Section 22 order in very lightly, and you'd only do it if, if necessary. Uh, I just have a couple questions, um, and I won't harp on communication other than that uh, talking to the Chair of uh, Grimsby DIA, Grimsby DIA was actually never contacted by uh, Niagara Public Health. So, so there was a bit of a slip up there. I don't have information about Grimsby Chamber, but uh, that's just, just a, an aside. Uh, one of the questions I have is patios. Why are patios uh, um, under the same order as, uh, as inside the restaurant? Uh, uh, and I'm not a, not, uh, expert on health, obviously, but uh, I, it would seem to me that, that it would be much safer and much, le much less chance of transmission. And then just in, in Grinsby, we have a number of restaurants that have been doing a great job and uh, been uh, uh, working very well with following every order and, and uh, complying uh, every every way and and i would probably hazard the, and i would make a guess that and it's only opinion an opinion that there was probably no incidences of transmission in in actually in grimsby uh, our numbers have been very low and it, it just feels to me on un, unfortunate that that we are moving this way but that is only my opinion um and i just want to say that that um uh, that I really, I, I see that, that it is for the safety of all and um, and don't take any decision lightly, but uh, it, it's just put kind of an unfortunate position and and it's been a long haul, um, everything. And, and it is it is just becoming increasingly difficult. So I'll end it at that. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Chair, I, I totally hear the mayor's comments around how difficult it is to get through this pandemic. And, you know, the one thing I'll say is that I think we're starting to see information on the light being near the end with information coming that a vaccine is highly effective in the interim results. And so hopefully it's not going to be too much longer that we have to keep this up. But we do need to keep it up so we can make sure people's lives are saved in that next little, you know, push over the next few months. In terms of the uh, question around outdoor dining, you know, it's absolutely true that with the ventilation that comes from wind blowing outdoors, that is going to be safer than dining indoors. However, it doesn't completely negate that the inherent risk when people are close together within two meters, having social contact for a prolonged period of time, that infection can spread in that group. And so people sitting together at a table outdoors are still going to be at risk of infection spreading. And so that still remains something that we do need to make sure we reduce in terms of infection spreading going forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jordan. We now have Councillor Butters. Thank you, Chair Bradley. Um, and thank you, Dr. Herji, for your presentation. Um, many of my questions have been asked and answered. So um, I would like you to comment on um, on your slide presentation, I believe on 43, it shows um, weekly cases per 100,000 population and it indicates Niagara, Brant, um, HNHU and Waterloo. And it shows that um, there was a, all of a sudden like looks like a drop in Brant on the week of October 31st. Do you, um, do you know why that happened? Yeah, Mr. Chair, unfortunately I don't know what happened there in Brant. I haven't asked them. Okay, because I, I just find it interesting like that all of a sudden their their numbers took a nosedive. So I'm curious to know whether or not they if it was something that um, their public health um, did or or didn't do yeah. um, in terms of that. So I wonder if you could um, maybe check into that and maybe there's information that would be valuable for Niagara, who knows? 
And my other question is about, um, have you looked at uh, more targeted areas of restriction because across Niagara, there are spots where um, it looks like infection um, is and low risk in certain uh, municipalities as opposed to maybe others that's mm -hmm. quite a bit higher. Have you looked at that as opposed to a blanket um, restriction? Yeah, Mr. Chair, we, we certainly think about that. Um, you know, I think about some of my colleagues in other local public health agencies where they've described something on the order of 40 times different between one part of their region and another part of the region in terms of COVID-19 spread. So, you know, we do see a relative, much smaller variation here in Niagara, but there is definitely a variation. On the flip side, we're also mindful about having an even Oh my God! This one f freaks me out. If you were ever afraid of dying of COVID, just look at this one. What the fuck, dude? What's with that hair? Sorry. Um, here, G. So, so far we've got uh, um, clavicle. We have a problem. H no, Houston, we have a clavicle. Um, suggesting we need a snitch line. Okay. Barb Butters? Uh, a Barb, person who does, uh, um, own a, a, um, an establishment. don't go to too much effort to clean don't up your fucking joint there, Barb. Bar. You know you're on camera, right, Barb? BB, mm, Counselor Butters. Four months decide to go out for the day. Oh, fuck. Uh, you know what? I'm just here for Mark Wood. I support the guy. I think he's got a good movement going. He's got over 2,000, 500 people joined just today, it looks like. Yesterday, 1,500. Now he's over 2,000 people that support this movement. And he guess what? We're here for nothing, as it turns out, because council can't do shit. Council can, you know, they could pass something if they had the fucking gonads to pass a, a resolution but they can't force Hirji to do anything. He is the man. He's the man. He's the man. He reports only to Doug Ford. And Doug Ford, well, we just look at the rest of my timeline to find out what Doug Ford said today. Reported by 610 CKTB, who's been clowning these guys. Clowning Mark Wood in his group saying that they're on a witch hunt you know what that here here's what's wrong with our local media fat homo said on the radio yesterday and i say fat homes did i say homo fat homes fat homes said on the radio yesterday that these guys were calling for here head and i always say these guys i i talk about mark wood and his group no one called for this guy's head. No one's saying head should roll. Give me his head. Take like fuck. Could you could you stoke any more fear and rage in people just on your regular show? Plug Fat Holmes. Fat Holmes has a radio show on what used to be Tom McConnell's slot on 610 CKTB every morning after Tim Dennis goes till 10 o'clock. I don't listen anymore. I can't, I can't be bothered to listen to the stuttering idiocy and the humor, the, <laughs> the giggling all the time. Why am I rambling? Because Barb Butters... Um, <laughs> didn't clean her room Gary's Leppo was solid Tim Rigby turned out to be solid because he spilt the beans on the fact that he was at an agri health committee meeting and here G was there the day before and didn't fucking spill the beans that he was gonna drop this measure the next day thank you Mr. Mayor Tim Rigby nice contribution there's my boy Jimmy D in the background with the sub he's got a purple jacket on tonight. What's up with that? I don't envy your um you you must lay awake nights thinking of No, no, he doesn't. Here's the thing. Will one counselor will one counselor have the fucking testicles to tell this guy that he's way out over his skis? He's flying way past his angels here. 
His protection has outrun him. And I don't mean that in a security violent sense. I'm like, dude, you have jumped the shark. You bit off more of the... How many fucking euphemisms <laughs> metaphors do I need to pull out? ...are also required to have a hand sanitizer at the entrance, so hopefully they're... Hand sanitizers. Do you know how fucking useful hand sanitizers are? Do you know that hand sanitizers actually take the good bacteria off your hands and make the big ones that really make you sick a little bit more effective at getting into you? You need bacteria in your hands, dudes. Stop using hand sanitizer. Soap and water works just as well. Fuck do I need to tell you people this shit for? Where do you see risk of infection spreading? is when people have close social interactions with each other. If you look on our website, we actually have one of our metrics that we track and provide to the public is the number of cases uh, who we aren't able to find a link for, which is what we call community transmission. And that number is 24 point something. So let's say about 25, just under 25% this week. 75% of people who get COVID-19 we are able to trace back to the person they got it from because by looking at the social interactions and the people that they've hung out with, we are able to identify who they got that infection from. And so I think one of the big misunderstandings sometimes people have is that they think that if you're at a store... We started this broadcast. Oh, whoa, whoa. We started this broadcast at 4.30. It was almost on time. It was a few minutes late, but pretty much on time. It's coming up to 7 o'clock. And here she's still behind the lectern. It's not a podium. You stand on a podium to get a medal, fools. And you never leave the lectern unattended. You can take notes on the lectern. The, um, you know, grocery store and you can spend... Um, 4.30, the 5.30, 6.30, wow, maybe looking two and a half hours behind it if you want. Check out and checking out. You're not having any kind of social interaction, which puts you at high risk of infection spreading. Obviously, if a thousand people are going to the Costco, I would hope the Costco is making sure that it's not getting crowded and people are able to maintain some reasonable physical distance. And guess what they're not doing at Costco? They're not taking names and, 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 and numbers and they're not contact tracing. They don't know. Guess what the restaurant and bar industry is doing? Taking everyone's ID, everyone's contact information, and reporting it to you so that you can fucking shut them down. Fools. They're the only industry that is participating in contract tracing, and you're punishing them into bankruptcy, you fascist. <laughs> Terror, t what is it? <laughs> Terror, not to, you know, um, tyrannical. <laughs> Terry, geez. Jeepers. Can a person or business, a group, or anybody appeal to Section 22 to the health board? Short answer is no. Um, yes, the order itself does set out the right to a hearing and the process whereby a hearing can be requested. So that is something that's available in accordance with the legislation and is clearly stated on the order itself. Yeah, but they can deny the hear they can deny the request at the hearing for any reason. If we're not able to direct or influence a decision by uh, you know Dr. Hergy as our chief medical officer, how would we deal, how could you possibly deal with an appeal if you can't, your hands are tied as far as trying to change anything? So through the chair, um, the right to request a hearing is specific to those who are named in the order. So owners or operators of the food premises that are the subject of the order would have the right to seek a hearing um, to challenge the order before the hearing board. Right, and so again through you, so that we had a hear, we have a hearing, and then the majority of the board, which would be the, the majority of council, decides that they want to change that. So, under an appeal process, are the rules different than the process of simply giving direction? I think, council, uh, council, I think uh, uh, Ms. Gibbs has a, a 
clarification again. Yes, thank you, Chair. My my apologies, um, Councilor Campion. I, I didn't understand. Um, the board that the hearing would be to is the Health Services Appeal and Review Board. Um, so it's okay. not the Board of Health that appoints the Medical Officer of Health. It's it's a separate body that independently hears adjudications of this kind. So the appeal would go to that body to make a determination, and the Medical Officer of Health would be a party to that appeal, um, but Council would not. And they are also stacked with Thank provincial appointees. Clear. Yeah. That, that makes my mind a little calmer. Um, so I, I guess I'll go over to Dr. Herji through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as you're aware, I sent you an email the other day asking for you to re reconsider Section 22. And I think I was pretty respectful with that, uh, with that request. But there was one, I made a, a comment in the email, which I'd like to read back. It's just two sentences and maybe get a comment from, from uh, Dr. Herji. So the provincial uh, orange status is designed to increase restric restrictions while keeping businesses open. The added restriction under Section 22 makes it virtually impossible for restaurant business to stay open. So the Section 22 decision potentially undermines the objectives of the provincial mandated uh, orange designation. I just think you get a comment on um, what, what you think about that statement, uh, Dr. Herji, through you, Chair. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, I obviously can't comment on every business. I imagine there's some diversity and uh, this will be a greater hardship on some versus others, depending on who their clientele are. Uh, you know, ultimately, I think it comes back to me around, you know, the goal I have to do as medical officer of health is find ways to lower the spread of infection. And I believe this order was necessary to accomplish that. Um, no, it's not. And it's not working and it won't work and it's not proven to work. And you're a fascist totalitarian um, dictator, period. Decisions that you have to make, and you know, from a perspective of a, a representative of the people in Welland and across Niagara, um, you know, I feel it's incumbent on, on me and others to ensure that we're at least considering all options and all opportunities and to protect not only the community from disease, but also our businesses from uh, bankruptcy and uh, unfair treatment. And so, you know, I think it's been explained a, a bit here that it, it appears to be- Hallelujah. Mayor Campion from Welland so finally kind of speaks some reason to this man. How, how you can get mixed up with the whole thing as to who's doing what and, and I certainly respect your analysis and putting that together. Dr. Nobody Dr. respects your analysis because it's I wrong. Like to do is continue at least to Campion look is at very respectful. Are, you know, looking, look at the changing and a solid leader things change here for the looking most part. At the effects of the, the orange designation and the relationship between that and the, um, the uh, section 22 order and, and hoping that we can find a way that we can kind of rescind that order in a, a very responsible way. This is funny. Data this and, uh, is CNN and, so and it's hilarious as shit. So I'll, I'll leave that. Those were my questions. I really wasn't going to make that last comment. I lost control of myself. So sorry that that was not a question. Uh, so I'm, I'm <laughs> finished. Thank you, Chair. That's honest. Thank you, Councillor Campion. We now go to Councillor Easton. Sandra Easton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mayor Easton, to you. Dr. Herji must be getting quite tired. But I must yeah, we're say, all getting um, tired. I want to thank you very much, sir, for um, the fact that you remained very, um, very neutral through all of this. Bullshit. Neutral is not what this dude is. All, which I think is an incredible quality to have. And you are saying that we can and we will do better, and we are encouraging that. Um, Dr. Herji, we, um, listen, grandma, um, when the report was made to Toronto, was that, I hope you got more game than that. Oh, what's sure going on here? Fully this is not the me. Question, if the council so, might want to rephrase slightly, just so I make sure I answer that. Sure. Uh, when it was report, when the conditions in Niagara were reported, on the last occasion before the section 23 came in were the cases on the farm applied as one isolated location um mr chair i'm not totally understanding the 
province did use, of course, local measurement of the number of cases per population to determine whether or not Niagara should be in the yellow. Answer the fucking question. Was the farm considered one location or not? I think we are appropriately paced based on their metrics in the orange level, which is where we would be if that farm was excluded from our numbers. Okay, all right, that's fine. And um, Dr. Herji, uh, I understand that there's about, in or, I don't know, maybe it's close to 1,600 restaurants, um, places where food is, is served. Are the wineries included in there as well? Mr. Chair, yes, wineries are included within this. Okay. Order. So I think I remember you saying quite a while ago that there's 15 instances of spread by bar or restaurant contact. Is, do you recall that? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I do recall Okay. That. And that was in four different restaurants. Uh, Mr. Chair, for the youth social cluster that we've talked about, there were four different restaurants where we know infection did spread. In that group. Okay, I know you're not paying for this content right here, so it's bonus. Oh no. Go back to Caitlin. I like her mouth. <laughs> what what is the number if we just look at restaurants? Mr. Chair, I would not know what the number would be. The percent positivity is the number of people testing positive divided by the total number of people who've been tested. And I don't know the total number of people who've been tested who have been to our restaurant. Okay, so it's not divided. The denominator is not the number of restaurants. I uh, know, Mr. Chair, it would not be the number of restaurants. It would be a number of... In other words, our data sucks. Okay, Dr. Herji, um, I have other concerns besides, these, uh, besides the numbers. Uh, because I happen to believe that um, there are times absolutely in the medical office or health has to make decisions quite independently. And I happen to be reading the 2005 Ontario Medical Association Health Policy Report that explained the state of the public health system from the time of Walkerton through the SARS mm -hmm. through to a rubella outbreak in Oxford County and one that included an effective governance that was in the Skoka Ferry Sound. And Justice O'Connor, who led the SARS Commission, stated that the existing legislative system scheme requires every Board of Health to appoint a full-time medical officer of health to ensure security and independence of the office. And then Justice Campbell said that the Medical Officer of Health and Public Health Units are the backbone of Ontario Public Health and they require a strong focus of attention, support, consultation and resources. Now, I know that Public Health hasn't had full staff since June and you've indicated tonight that, um, um, well, I don't want to interpret this uh, too, um, in too granular a way, but I, I believe Here we go. that what I heard okay. you now, if we go full screen on this poor lady who has the um, the flat smile with a curve up at the sides, I don't know why I um, seem to be so infatuated with this woman's mouth, but come on, just put her full screen so we can get back to Barb Butters. Come on, you can do it. Producer, video director, full screen the woman. It's not going to happen, is it? Oh, damn it. You didn't pay for this content, and it's just bonus. It's, um, Caitlin something? Fuck. I'm going to have to listen to her now? No. Back to Herji. Before cases rise much higher so that we can prevent, for example, going into the red level where there would be further restrictions put on our economy, on social life, and, of course, us having more cases in the community which would affect more vulnerable people around us. Just to go back to the comments around contact tracing, we are absolutely actually hiring people. If you go onto our website in the job postings right now, you will see a standing job posting there for additional public health nurses, for example, so that we can have more staff to do this work. One of the challenges is, that, of course, since the start of this pandemic, we have been hiring additional temporary staff to do this work, and we've largely exhausted why, the why, pool why? of, you know, 
highly capable people Why? to do this work. And we are now here. Why won't you full screen this girl? Oh, for fuck's sakes. We have less education, less of a skill level, and be able to train them up to do that work. And we're, of course, going out and doing that work. I actually just signed off another job description yesterday for hiring along those lines. But the challenge, of course, is when you bring in someone new, there's a long period of a few weeks to train them up to be able to do that work. And so it does take a bit of a leg. And given that we're a pool of people is exhausted out there of who we can hire, because of course, every other local public health agency is trying to hire at the same time, it is going to mean that we have limited ability to keep building up our numbers to do this kind of follow up and get the kinds of people we need to do case and contact follow up. And so getting the number of cases and number of contacts down, it needs to be part of the approach of how we get the ability to continue to follow up effectively. All right, thank you very much for that. However, Dr. Herji, I think that um, the ability to look at things in the very, with the very long range, particularly when it comes to human resources, is something that it is a burden that the council, uh, that is part of our role. Mm -hmm. And I become very nervous when I see that there are potential barriers, whether they're internal barriers and you're being discouraged not to hire early, whatever that is. We really need to um, turn that around so that uh, you can exercise the independence that your um, that your role intends to uh, intends to uh, have in place, and and I I want to uh, reinforce that independence. But the other another thing that I found very interesting about this Ontario Medical Association article was that it defined the role of the medical officer of health under four headings. And one of them is clinical expertise, another is clinical leadership and engagement. But here's one under community leadership and engagement, and there's another under management and team building. And my question really under community leadership and engagement is, what do you see? How do you see the role of the medical officer of health in building that stakeholder support, building the credibility not only amongst your peers, but uh, with other people, with restaurant owners, for example, or people who own retail stories, the, the, the main street people. How do you see building that community leadership so that when a really tough decision like this needs to be made, that they already have some idea of what it is, the, the scope of your responsibilities and the scope of your control uh, and it becomes less of a surprise. I mean, I don't want to harp on the communication thing. I want to understand what it is that you, how you see the role and what we can do to help with that. So it, right about now, I think if you had a really, uh, a, a different kind of a communication model, and I don't mean that coming from you directly, that we wouldn't be having this conversation. We would have already had it. And I believe in the way you've been talking tonight, that you would also be open to some influence, even though you are looking for a very defined outcome. So Mr. Chair, of course, you know, engaging with their community and the many different stakeholders we have is critical. Obviously during a pandemic like this, we need everybody working together, but actually even outside of- Translation, we will not listen to anything you say. This order is going to stand, and there's nothing that council can do about it. Period. As a community, and so we're always trying to build those networks and build those alliances, so we can all work together as a unit to have that collective action to improve those. In terms of engaging with our stakeholders, you know that we do an enormous amount of work on that. Dr. Andrea Feller, my associate, actually spends the majority of her time engaging with our many different stakeholders within the you know, local area municipality emergency management community, with our healthcare partners, with our hospitals, with the you know, many different uh, provincial agencies that are involved in uh, it, working on COVID-19 with us. It actually is you know, more than just a full-time job for her just to continue engaging and building those relationships with stakeholders. I think one of the biggest challenges for us is that of course, COVID-19 is impacting absolutely everybody in our community. And it's impacting absolutely everybody in very significant ways. And so we are actually overwhelmed in some level by the number of you know, stakeholders we need to manage and engage with and work with, while at the same time, of course, doing all of the on the ground work of managing COVID-19. And so 
We've set up many different, you know, stakeholder tables and healthcare tables where we meet with on a weekly basis to give input, hear their feedback, work together on moving things along. Obviously, you know, there seems to be some gaps and there's more improve, uh, work that we can do to improve it. And I certainly would appreciate any feedback or advice on other groups that need to be engaged more to, you know, have that full, you know, engagement with the entire community. Well, thank you very much for that, um, um, Dr. Herji. I just want to close then, uh, Dr. Herji and, and my colleagues with a, uh, another uh, statement that came from the OMA because they don't believe in uh, local boards of health. Because of all the negative outcomes that have that occurred uh, um, um, in some of those instances that I mentioned, they stated that so long as local boards of health remain in place, the local med medical officer of health should have full chief of executive officer authority for local public health services and be accountable to the local board. And that Section 67 of the Health Protection and Promotion Act should be enforced and, if necessary, amended to ensure that personnel and machinery, machinery meaning a strong, full out staff to support that is required to deliver public health protection, are not buried in municipal bureaucracy. Well, I don't know about being buried in municipal bureaucracy, but I think we all understand that this um, health board really hasn't been part of the decision-making process. Um, and I think it's absolutely essential that that has to change. And I believe that you understand that. So protecting the independence of a local medical officer of health is about decision-making. And that's what Dr. Herji has done here, as painful as it is for all of us. And the other thing that was said, and I think this is very important, given some of the unfortunate comments made, is that uh, the medical officer of health is to be protected by providing no adverse employment action against them for any medical officer of health in respect of the good faith exercise of those reporting powers and duties. So if we didn't understand some of the independence and some of the um, human resources elements uh, for the position of medical officer of health, I think we're much better off now. Um, I am concerned, Dr. Herji, about um, the fact that you've been down one position since June. I understand the limitations. However, you know, um, I think that we probably need to look, do our, put our preemptive strike, strike principles in place when we're looking at um, the capacity, uh, because certainly if we need surge capacity now, I think we're going to be quite limited. I, I very much appreciate your comments, uh, sir, and that you have uh, stood our question this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Easton. We now go to Councillor Diodati. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Herji, uh, for taking all these questions and helping us to understand uh, where you're coming from on, on some of these decisions. Uh, my first question, I, I need a little bit of clarification because I'm not able to answer the question and I reached out to our Board of Health people on un, the, the Health Committee and unfortunately they don't know the answers either. So I'm hoping I can get them from you. Under your Section 22 order, is it the same household that we're talking for plus two caregivers or is it four in total? That's my first question. Uh, so Mr. Chair, under our order, it is the household plus one or two people who are necessary or important for physical and mental health of a person. So that is in addition to people. So it's people outside of the household who might be required for that. That being said, the province's rules in orange level do require that no table can have more than four people. Okay, so which leads me to my next question, you know, which, can, which is confusing people. So the province is saying four, and we're restricting it to uh, a different number. So this is potentially six. So are you concerned that the confusion is gonna lead to people not knowing what to do through your chair? Yeah, Mr. Chair, it is unfortunate that the province had the surprise announcement about orange level. Uh, if we'd known about that, we would have probably have communicated and actually timed our measure to you know, align with the province to have a bit more clarity around that. The idea here is that actually both need to occur. 
dining only with your household and one or two additional persons who's necessary for physical and mental health. And that total number can't exceed four according to the provincial regulations. So I guess it just draws uh, to your attention the fact that you didn't know what the province was doing. They didn't communicate it. And hopefully it gives you an idea of what it feels like to be us when you haven't given us an indication of what your intentions are. It's, it's difficult at best at times. Certainly now it's very difficult. So I understand what you're saying right now, but I don't think it's clear to most people. And I think that's one of the concerns about the uh, Section 22 order not completely falling within the framework of the provincial order. And it's something that I hope you're going to uh, take a look at. I know uh, Mayor senzik has got a motion later on the agenda, and I'm hoping that you're going to be able to uh, hopefully speak to it because I think we could definitely do a better job. That's for sure. And I don't want to spend my time on that. I think we've all agreed we could do a better job, all of us. Fuck, if senzik has got a motion, we're going to be here till fucking midnight. Situation that thousands of people here in Niagara are going to be dealing with very soon. They're going to have kids coming home from university. And sometimes they have them come home on the weekends now. So my question to you is, what whole household are they going to be a part of when they come home? Through you, Chair. So, Mr. Chair, I think the intention would be that they're part of the household where they're living most of the time. So presumably during the week, that would be their household. Whether uh, they have the arrangement with their parents that they would see that each other as being necessary for each other's emotional support, that might be one way that they could still dine together as a family. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, unfortunately, this is the first time I've been able to, to get this answer. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are not sure how to interpret this. They're not sure what to do, and it's gonna cause a lot of confusion. So hopefully when we're done going through this process between tonight and tomorrow night, we're gonna be able to come up with, I think, a, 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 an angle that everybody here's my support, angle everyone at the table uh, so that lives that in the same household there. at this point in time can have two support workers with them <laughs> uh, Butter's, uh, story was excellent i thought it perfectly uh showed exactly the dilemma and the hypocrisy that we're feeling when people are saying how do you judge this business but not that business so the question i'm going to ask you is how how can you attribute the source of spread to restaurants when most businesses don't do contact tracing? It's exactly me, Dr. nice Kirby, job, they, Jimmy. They're just the downriver net that's catching things, not necessarily the place that's causing the spread. So I'm just wondering, how do you how do you attribute the source of the spread to restaurants? So, Mr. Chair, I wouldn't actually attribute the source of spread to restaurants, but to the socializing of people at a restaurant. So why are you closing them down the for then, really. Dickhead? It's about the people who choose to go and have... <sighs> Mayor Jimmy D is a solid dude. Agree with him or not? Solid dude. The way we're able to know that is, of course... He knows the fix is in. ...contact tracing efforts because we actually follow up with where have people been during the timeline when they could become infected and can we find another case of COVID-19 that they were with during that time? And so we're really looking for that, that... Was there a person who was infected with COVID-19 in the time when they may have become infected? And we have found that link definitively to another case in restaurants multiple times. We're not finding it in these other settings. Okay, so I, I think you could probably see the frustration with these uh, restaurant owners when they're doing everything they can. Yeah. And they're not necessarily the source of the spread. It's people coming in there, and if they're keeping them in their seats, in their place, wearing their masks when they walk to the washroom and when they come in and out, and they're sanitizing and contact tracing, do, do you see the frustration and consternation of these people who are doing everything they can do and after having done everything they can do now are going to be restricted further? Because I can tell you a number of restaurants have been absolutely empty right now because of this, because people aren't sure what to do. So when people are confused, they do nothing. So I'm wondering if you understand, I understand what you're saying, but that I don't know, do you understand that the restaurants are not understanding what you're saying? They're wondering why they're being the ones, the scapegoat, I'll call it, or the one that's gonna have to suffer for human behavior. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I absolutely understand it. I'm sure I don't understand it to the same severity and acuity that a restaurant owner does who actually has to live through that. But 
I absolutely understand. It's extraordinary. Yeah, because you're getting two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year for your post there in term acting officer of medical health in the Niagara region. 250k not one of these regional counselors knows what it's like to get a SERP check or to be without money or to have your business closed or to try to apply for a fucking loan when you have less than fifty thousand dollars payroll no i'm looking though at the where our cases are going and where they could end up and i don't want us to get into the red level where there's further restrictions on restaurants or if we end up you know going down the road of actually having a lockdown here or they're actually completely shut down I recognize that there's severe See, this is how they this is how they condition you just in case and they're going to balance your well-being and the well-being of the complete community's health concern with your selfish need to provide an income for yourself. This is fascism. Fascism. If the if the province is limiting limiting us through provincial order to four people and here, through Section 22, we're allowing four from the same household plus potentially a caregiver. That puts them over the provincial order number. So will they be fined if they've got more than four? That's that's their question. Will they be fined under the provincial order through you, Chair? Okay, right, Mr. Chair. I, I think there was some misunderstanding there. Or I didn't do a good enough job of explaining it. The total number we consider a table is going to be four people, according to the provincial regulation. Based on our order, those four have to be made, made up of, by people from the same household or people from the same household plus one or two who are essential to physical and mental health for that person. But the total number there is still four. So right now your Section 22 order, I don't think it says that. So, uh, and certainly if it does, it's not clear. So my no, because we're making up the rules on the fly here, Mayor Jim Diodati. Yeah, this is Mustafa Hirji, Dr. Mustafa Hirji, and he makes up things as he goes here. This is how we work this. Getting a region back down into the yellow zone, in which case all of a sudden our order would now be more restrictive in other ways, which we don't want to intend to do. I think there's absolutely room though that we can better communicate this to our business partners and make sure they understand the rule. And I thank the mayor for highlighting that that's a need to communicate that better. Yeah, maybe maybe communicate, but I, I think maybe it needs to be clear, uh, to be honest with you. It's hard to communicate something fuzzy. I just my that's my opinion. Uh, my next question to you, Chair. Now, Dr. Urji, have you considered, I'm sure you have, but I need to ask the question, have you considered the human nature within this household dining restriction in that although i know your intentions are good doctor my concern is your outcomes will not be good and my question is instead of the, the situation that it's been where people are in a controlled environment with contact tracing mask sanitizing and distancing people will now be pushed into private unsupervised settings and and i know that's already happening and, and it's my concern that it's going to get much, much worse as we get into the holiday season. And, and I'm concerned, and I want to ask you, have you considered this, you know, human nature, I'll call it, and this reality that people are being felt, or they're feeling that they're being forced underground to avoid, uh, you know, public um, judgment, they're going to go and privately meet where there won't be masks and distancing definitely not contact tracing maybe not can i give a little love from my boy that? mayor jim d i don't fucking agree with this guy on everything thunder water thundering waters is a whole sure, thing we're always thinking about the unintended consequences of our but at least he's taking the, the dude it could fall through like he's telling the dude okay well you know they're just gonna go in their homes right at a restaurant, but this at a table is the hypocrisy of the tyrannical left that just wants power. I mean, he's got his money already, but he wants power. The power to control where you go, how you move, who you meet with, and if you are sustainable as a small business. And you know what? The small businesses that don't qualify for anything right now are the ones with under two, with under fifty thousand dollars payroll. You're fucked. You get nothing. So, so you're not concerned that this could make things worse? Mr. Chair, I don't believe the net impact is going to be worse. Obviously, we're going to be watching the data closely to see what we find. 
especially seeing what we learned through our contact tracing efforts of where are people getting infected. Wrong. Lockdowns don't work. Masks don't work. You know what? Keep your distance. Wash your hands. Don't touch doorknobs. Fools. Doctor, how will we be able to know if they were to um, pick this uh, virus up while being at a private function in someone's house? Uh, how are they? There's no contact tracing. How will you ever determine where it came from? You don't think they're going to say it happened when I was maybe at the department store, maybe at work. They're not going to tell you that they gathered at a house. Mr. Chair, uh, you know, we, the contact tracing we do finds out where people have been. And often we find where someone maybe has withheld some information. We're able to find out through other means to their contacts and friends that whoa, actually know whoa, there maybe was a gathering. Whoa, 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 whoa. doctor. How are you finding we'll out things finding through other means? Dude, clip this. Lying, but are you seriously, they they what? Because you're going to have people rat on you? Chair, my concern is if they're already overwhelmed with contact tracing in Toronto and Peel, we're not going to be able to follow up and investigate. We don't have the staff time for that. I don't think, I think it's unrealistic, but okay. Uh, we'll just, we'll note this and we'll track it. Uh, my ne next question to you, Chair, is I know you had a slide there from Halton uh, from Dr. Magani. Um, but the part that caught my attention was at the bottom of the slide, it said, these recommendations are not provincial orders and will not be enforced. I wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, so the letter that the uh, Medical Officer of Health for Halton put out was a letter advising the community, similar to the letter that I put out on Thursday, advising the community of the importance of us limiting our social interactions to just our household. I've of course watched what's happened in Halton since then, and Halton has actually seen their numbers continue to rise. And unfortunately, they have similar I just to Toronto. Want to say, it's 7.30. We're three hours into this dog and pony show sponsored by the Niagara region. Defund the region. These turkeys don't need the money. And we can leave our own municipalities to their own devices. Uh, Dr. Herji, if limiting dining to members of the same household has not been done yet elsewhere, what makes you think it's going to work here? And are you concerned that Niagara's being seen as used as guinea pigs through your chair? It's not going to work. Mr. Chair, you know, I think the choice here is do we sit still and see what's happening in all our neighbors where our infections continue to rise? Or do we find ways where we can find a balanced approach to hopefully curb that uh, change? You know, I think the reason Absolute many people are propaganda. This is your Niagara regional government, and this is why they all deserve to lose their jobs. Sell the building, get rid of these guys. Let us go back to 12 communities. Yeah, we'll put a Niagara regional board of directors together for buying services like trash and water. And yeah, we're going to need a service provider, unelected officials. You chair maybe is directed more toward the lawyer, I think, or solicitor. Probably, um, and hopefully, I've heard that word mentioned a number of times throughout the presentation, which doesn't make me feel good. Um, it concerns me. And my concern is also the burden of proof is, the burden of proof is going to be a serious challenge. And I don't know that we'll have a reasonable prospect of convictions, especially given that we're working outside of the provincial framework. And I asked the question through you, Chair, to our solicitor, what's your opinion of that? Strong question. Through the through the chair, um, obviously in in legal, we engaged with Dr. Herji in the preparation of the order, and we believe that the order is enforceable. Um, again, it's open to businesses um, to take the opportunity, if they wish to do so, to ask for a hearing to challenge the order, and that would be the proper form for them to do that. As Here's what you do, businesses: um, and sue the region for loss of wages, for punitive damages, for damage to your mental health, put a class action suit together, get organized, and sue the fuck out of the region and bankrupt these assholes. The last part again, Chair, through you, um, I'd like to know, working outside of the provincial framework, does that diminish our chance of success through you, Chair? Uh, th through the chair, no, it does not. Um, I think, and I, I tried to speak to it in the opening context comments that I provided. I think that Section 22 
in terms of its wording expressly recognizes the fact that medical officers of health have that ability to act in accordance with what is necessary to respond to what is Holy happening. Shit. Seriously. Seriously. Legal mumble jumbo. It's 734. We're three hours into a special meeting and no delegations have taken the platform yet. Here, geez, behind the lectern. Okay, thank you for that. And last two questions, Chair. Uh, Dr. Urji mentioned tightening social circles. And I don't need to tell you, it's coming into holiday, holiday season. We've got Diwali, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas. A lot of reasons why people are coming together. University, college is going to be getting out. Kwanzaa? Dude, Kwanzaa's not a fucking holiday. People have already sacrificed their Easter, their Thanksgiving, their Eid, in the hopes of gathering this holiday season. And I've heard many people say, we've been sacrificing the entire year just so that now we can come together as a family. So my question is, do you really believe this directive will have the desired outcome on people? No. Mr. Chair, I do believe it's gonna help us bring the numbers of cases of COVID-19 down. It will not. It will not. You know what helps? Keep your distance, wash your hands. That's it. No lockdown, no masks. No prohibit. What, what are they? They've outlawed singing for crying out loud. I don't want that to be the one that happens. I don't want to see the lives lost because of that. I don't want to see the economic. Lives, if you sing in public, lives will be lost. At this point, uh, through you, Chair. Uh, and Dr. Urji, um, I know that the Chambers of Commerce are very, very concerned right now about this and not necessarily supportive of it. Uh, they don't know that this is the best approach. I, I, we know that you're a medical health expert, but there are many of them business experts and they know how things are going to play out on the other end. Mm -hmm. And my question is, did you consult with any hospitality operators or experts before you made any decisions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, as mentioned, we asked our business improvement associations, chambers of commerce and dev offices to reach out to contacts in the uh, restaurant bar winery industry, et cetera, to get their feedback on our proposed terms for the order. And so we would review that. And so we did get that feedback and we did take that into account. Did you get support or were they concerned? How would you characterize it through your yeah. chair? Yeah, Mr. Chair, as I previously answered to others, I wouldn't characterize anybody as supporting it. Obviously, nobody wants to have restrictions put on their business. I wouldn't expect anybody to be happy about that. There was, you know, a group of them who, you know, uh, understood what we were trying to accomplish, weren't happy about it, and gave us advice on how it could be less harmful to them and allow them to be more viable going forward. And then there's another group to express strong opposition, and that's the feedback we received. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dear Daddy. Councilor Can I get some love from Mayor Jimmy D? I don't care if you love everything he does. Oh, here comes Wally. Uh, a, a good job of asking a number of pertinent. I'm surprised he doesn't have his mouth full of some granola bar or some shit. And this last two hours have been very informative. Actually, almost three hours been very informative about the approach that's being taken. The you know what I like about my mayor? He can, he, he's really good at tracking time. Well, related to the numbers and and what Dr. Herji and his team are seeing. And he's not gay. Not not even a little bit. Uh, the restaurant industry is going through a, a significant challenge and it's one of the hardest, if not, I think the hardest hit uh, in this pandemic. And I, I just want to touch on Dr. Herji. Um, you had an article in your presentation because I do want to, I want to focus on your, your PowerPoint. October 5th, you, you had, you had, there was an article and I believe the standard uh, that was pointing towards something that, that could be coming between October 5th and November 14th. What was, what could have been done differently that would have highlighted this trajectory that we were on? Yeah, Mr. Chair, obviously, you know, looking... Oh, dude, uh, don't bite your pencil like that. I want to come through the screen and have my way with you. That's hot. The communications and messaging that we did, however effective it was, was not effective enough. So one option would be to definitely you know, have used different messages or perhaps more intensity of some of those messages. 
I think perhaps there could have been opportunity to get a wider resonance amongst the community about the importance of people limiting their social interactions to just their household to help we get that message to have broken through further. Those would be a couple of the you know thoughts I would have. And I appreciate that through the chair. Talk a bit about enforcement. Mm -hmm. So we know that there was a Halloween event in in, an, yeah. in a municipality that that was a created a bit of an outbreak. Uh, talk about enforcement because really getting at the core of this is uh, the ability for people to recognize that we're in a a, a, yeah. a an emergency like situation, if you will. So talk about enforcement. Yeah, you know, I think, as I mentioned, one of the things we find that is not practiced as well as we would like is lots of businesses aren't necessarily screening their employees adequately before they show up to work every day. And that's in some cases allowing people with infection to enter the workplace and is one of the reasons why we have seen some spread of infection in the workplace. And so I think more proactive effort to be out okay, there. Okay, so that was now, not my cut. Like I was not focusing on Wally. Man, manhandling that pencil of his. Perhaps also, you know, we enforce it was a, what we know. It was about. a bad cut on the video director at the region. Okay, that's not on me. Don't fucking hang that shit on me. A message out about people should be sending in complaints about when they're seeing people breaking the rules or having gathering. Shut not up! So the, you're telling me we're gonna fucking start a snitch line, Doctor Mustafa Herji. Fuck you. You know what? That's why we we need people to rat on their neighbors over a similar period, if any other time thus far. And so maybe there actually is opportunity to encourage people to be getting these complaints in more, and maybe we haven't got that message out either to get better enforcement that way. And so through the chair in your position, is there an opportunity for lower tier municipalities to better support on the enforcement side yes. that currently hasn't taken place? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would want to defer to our manager of business licensing who works directly with the local area. Blah, 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 blah. Fuck. Seriously. Okay. Uh, the business licensing. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. The uh, So there is opportunities, uh, uh, Councillor Sesnick, to... Uh, uh, we are taking advantage of uh, a reach out that we did both last Friday and uh, yesterday, both the area CAOs and the managers of the bylaw offices in the uh, local area municipalities uh, to provide uh, operational hours that they're working uh, so that we know where to put our staff from the region in order to plug the holes where there is no, no staffing available. Uh, we're doing both proactive uh, inspections now as well as complaint driven inspections, uh, as well as handing out all possible information and signage that we can and advice to businesses, uh, not just bars and restaurants, but other businesses out there. As well, we're asking for information exchange between all the municipalities so that we have a better picture of the total number of inspections done for the provincial on, uh, enforcement of the provincial uh, OREG 36420. Uh, so that we can report back to council that uh, you have a better picture of exactly how many inspections are done, how many charges are issued throughout the region, not just by regional staff. So uh, we're going to move through with that and uh, provide an update. So we should be moving forward with some good enforcement measures uh, and not, not to say that they're not good, but better cooperation, better communication has already been discussed and better coordinated efforts. And I appreciate that. And I think through the chair, if I can be, maybe I'll be corrected. That's within the last two weeks that there's been a wrap up of the enforcement. Uh, if you, Mr. Chair, yes, that's, uh, that's been a ramp up just seeing where the deficiencies are. Okay. So thanks for your comments. Here's the solution. Defund the region. We don't need them. They're too far away from the problems to be offering solutions. They're overpaid. There's too much overlap. Turn them into a service provider get rid of the elected body and let us go back to 12 communities. So thank you. I think that is, is probably where I would like to apologize to the restaurant community. And I'd like to apologize because I, I, I think we as a government in some cases became complacent over the last couple of months, maybe since the summertime, we saw the numbers going down and the 
we, we, we didn't react as quickly as we did when March occurred and, and we all had to get a heightened sense of awareness of what was happening around us. And so, you know, uh, to a, to an industry that has, is, is being damaged severely, I think we, we let our community down and, and I'm going to use the word we, cause I think it's the 12 municipalities plus the region because the enforcement Whoa, side, am I agreeing with this man at the moment started to tick in a certain direction. The enforcement should have went up. And we knew that there was oh, no going hang on, to hang on, hang on. A, a, a concentration of people <laughs> as the weather turned as well that would be more indoors than outdoors. And I think I think the enforcement was the area where we missed the opportunity. And so uh, the, through the chair, um, again, it, it's the strategy that we have that Dr. Herji has been forced to to the card he's been forced to play with section twenty two came about because I don't believe that the the municipalities and and the region through public health have been coordinated well. And when I look at the one slide by the numbers, young adult outbreak, you've got 41 uh, exposure locations at bars, restaurants, 12 in the family home, 23 retail, 17 sports and recreation. Well, sports and recreation is pretty much municipalities. So there, and I've talked to our, our local municipality here in St. Catharines, there should have been a very specific discussion about what role can we play in tightening that 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 net so that COVID-19 couldn't spread. So we weren't really given, I don't believe, the opportunity, uh, Dr. Herji, to be at the table, if you will, to look at any main, any ways and means necessary to demonstrate to the broader community that the numbers and the contact points were getting out of control. And so I guess that's the, the, the frustration, uh, Dr. Herji, that, that I've, I've, I've expressed over the last little while, uh, last week, has been the inclusivity of bringing everybody to the table so that we all can play a role in not just informing the community, but looking at what our contact points are and how could we have tightened it instead of just targeting specifically the restaurants. And so um, I guess, Dr. Herji, we can't go back. We can't go back to October 5th. We can't go back to the, to the beginning of fall, but I think what you've heard, what I've heard from you today and what you've explained to council is that we're at a tipping point and that tipping point is going to go either to a direction that's going to cause more harm to the economy and more harm to, to, to the community, or it can go the other way where we're going to have a green Christmas, if you will. And by that, everyone knows what that means in terms of the framework. Um, I just don't know if what the steps that was taken with section 22 was the only steps. And if it was surgical in maybe the wrong, not the wrong way, but surgical in a way that targeted one, sector um but didn't didn't take into consideration other um other aspects of how the how the how the virus is in the community so i'll leave it at that uh but dr herji i think you did an outstanding job presenting the information in a very understandable way and i, I do hope the public today has a better sight line into we're not out of this pandemic by any stretch and if this was a marathon we're at the halfway point. We still have. Get used to living with it, dude. There's a new flu in town, okay? Stop scaring your citizens. Let's go back to work. <laughs> and stop supporting mandatory lockdowns and restrictions that are unreasonable to sectors of uh, the community and the business community that are not contributing to infections, you fucking retards in a dialogue with you is uh, to uh, determine whether having heard what members of council have said in terms of the questions directed to you and the suggestions or observations that they have, uh, can they be assured that uh, as you progress uh, did Jim, along the way. Did Jim Bradley just do a doo-doo in his diaper? I think, to, see, if I'm going to shit myself, that's what I look like when I do it that have been made uh, in this particular session. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think one of the clear themes from today has been Councillor feels that there needs to be better communication and earlier communication to them. And so that's one of the big takeaways that we're gonna take from this. 
There is actually a uh, memo later on in the agenda where we're proposing one forum where this could occur, but happy to receive any other feedback. And I think when we get to that item, we can discuss perhaps other ways that might be needed to ensure oh that kind God. of happens going forward. Lord Jesus uh, I, Christ. Listen to me. I don't say that. Uh, no, I'm praising. I'm serious. I'm praying. What the fuck? Consider what you're going to do. The last thing I'm going to mention is on oh. behalf of council because a question was asked, but I think uh, uh, to reiterate it uh, of our legal uh, staff is uh, uh, our director of legal services is once again to inform us how if any one of these individuals impacted by this may appeal, uh, they want to know kind of specifically how kinda, they go about here, it. Here's what you kind of do. Class uh, la, class action lawsuit against the region. You can maybe name Dr. Mustafa Hirji specifically. On the region's website in addition to their restaurants. Sue the region for mandating you into bankruptcy and mental torment for punitive damages that are unapproachable by most human beings and also to the medical officer of health um, in writing to request a hearing. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, I think we've engaged in a good dialogue a lot. Sue the region. You know why? They're well insured. And guess what? They settle out of court. Sue the region. You know what? <laughs> I'm not <laughs> I don't have any skin in this game other than I'm just, I'm concerned by the radical leftism. <laughs> There's a fly buzzing around my fudge. And, uh, and the tyrannical dictatorship of Niagara by one man that's not accountable to uh, the council, I think it's disgusting. And I fear for my fellow businessmen that are already teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. And this is going to break their backs. You fucking Ooh. Jim, I love you. Jim Bradley, good chair, great politician. Thank you in advance for your cooperation. And I now call upon Bruno. First del now we're in the, we're finally gonna get into delegations. I got it at seven fifty one. I'm calling at seven fifty one. Bruno's the first guy out of the gate with delegations. We've been here for three hours plus now. Uh, welcome, Mr. Caracetta. Hello? Hello. Uh, am I on, Mr. Chairman? You're thank on. You. <laughs> welcome. Um, thank you, sir. I appreciate the, uh, the invitation from Council to be able to speak with you. And I'm uh, joined here today with my, my, my two sons, who are also partners with me in the operation of the Rex Hotel here in Welland. Um, our business dates back to 1915, yes. wherein my grandfather opened a restaurant at this location. Uh, he operated that business in 1915, which was during World War I. He was able to keep that business open through First World War, through the pandemic of the Spanish flu, and the Great Depression. Also, through to the end of World War II. It's my hope that this business can survive this epidemic, but I think that may only be possible with the help of this council and the medical officer of health, of health. Last week, my business was mandated by a regional requirement to restrict page, patrons to only those from the same household, as well as those that needed uh, some support. In addition to that regulation, we had to reduce our numbers of chairs at a table down to four. The original restriction was six. And we have to 
restrict the number of patrons in the restaurant to a maximum of 50. That's about 50% of my capacity. Now, restrictions were imposed beginning last Saturday. I've compared the revenues that we had for the same period, the same days, a week before those restrictions were imposed. So it was four days, a Saturday, a Sunday, a Monday, and a Tuesday. When I compare the drop in revenue for the days that the restriction was imposed, it is a 60% drop in that revenue. As a business owner, if I see that drop of 60% throughout the next seven or eight days, I will have no option but to close the business. That would result in a layoff of approximately 70% of my staff. And I can only assume that many more other businesses will see a decline in revenues equal to mine. The combination of these two jurisdiction requirements have made the operation of this business unprofitable and virtually impossible to make a living. The restaurant and accommodation industry in this region is the biggest employer. And if this regulation is not rescinded or changed, there will be massive layoffs. The Medical Officer of Health has targeted restaurants as the major contributor of the spread of COVID. Now I've spoken with several other large restaurants in the Welland area, and they have not had any health unit staff come in to trace the beginnings of a COVID case. None of them have seen or have uh, encountered that problem. What's interesting is that the provinces of Alberta and British Columbia have urged their populations to dine at a restaurant rather than have gathering in their own home. The reasoning that those provinces have done that is because they believe restaurants are a safer place. One of the things that I think has been touched on at the meeting just recently, the last couple of uh, gentlemen speaking, was that instead of more regulations, wouldn't it be wiser to increase the enforcement of the existing regulations? By that I mean checking operations during the busy times, seven days a week, and not just during office hours. The province of Manitoba has actually hired a private company contracted to do the enforcement for them because they lack the amount of staff in order to do those enforcement. Now, I would urge this council, and I understand that an appeal can only happen through uh, a restaurant owner. The council can't be the one to, to, to appeal it. And I now have to decide whether I wish to spend the time, effort, and money to do that. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm joined with my sons, and I'd like the opportunity to have my son Bruno Jr. speak to you so he can share some interesting facts and figures that he's discovered. 
If that's okay, if that would be okay with you, Mr. Yes. Chairman, I'd appreciate it. Most assuredly it is. Thank you. How does your heart not break for this man? You can see the boys are on the edge of tears. Their um, fucking business has got the best pizza in the Niagara region. This is a stand-up guy in the community. Um, one of the, the biggest ones is there's 1,600 restaurants in Niagara that employs 30,000 people. Um, and I'm using the doctor's number here that 15 cases were found from October 4th to October 6th that were linked to restaurants. And during that same time, there was 484 new confirmed cases in Niagara. Um, this would link restaurants to about 3% of all cases during that time. Um, but as a doctor spitballed, a number of five to ten percent are coming in from outside of Niagara, and uh, no additional measures were taking place there. Um, so I'd like to know what's being done about the other ninety-seven percent of cases during this time. Um, as we know, uh, Niagara has entered stage three back on July twenty-fourth. That means restaurants were late, allowed to host people outside and indoors. Um, and by September 1st, cases in Niagara had dropped uh, down past five per day when we got all the way down to only one case reported on September 1st. Um, however, by the 30th of September, uh, new cases were up to 19. Given that restaurants were functioning under stage three guidelines for about five weeks and cases dropped to one per day, is there anything else that opened or happened in September that would have led to a 1900% increase in just a matter of four weeks? Um, back to the 15 cases that were linked to 1600 restaurants in Niagara. Um, let's say one case occurred at the, like every case has its own restaurant. So say 15 restaurants had a case. Um, we're looking at less than 1% of restaurants that have a COVID related case attributed to them. Uh, and for comparison's sake, in the past two weeks alone, 11 cases arose out of our 97 schools in that. That's 11%. Um, given that substantial difference between 11% and 1%, what additional measures were introduced by our public health to combat that? So in that same five week span, the October 1st to November 6th, um, let's just say conservatively saying restaurants, each restaurant averaged about 50 patrons a day, uh, 1600 restaurants. That would equate to about 2.8 million visits over a five week span. 15 people contracted COVID at a restaurant. To put that in perspective, that's 0.0005% of visits resulted in COVID. That's five cases for every 100,000 visits. Uh, maybe instead of focusing on the efforts into reducing the spread at restaurants, Niagara Health should be praising the efforts in the operators of these establishments the staff have done an amazing job. Man, amen, um, brother. You give it to him. These seem fantastic. You, you know who you don't want to mess with? Is that dude off to the right. Uh, on a final note, uh, <laughs> that public health should stop using the term household. Come on, man. Uh, when Let's go back to work. You want to wear your mask, wear your mask. Defund the region. By the doctor that stop locking these guys down. So long as they're vital to mental and physical health. Um, my understanding, there is multiple academic studies that support that close friends, family members that don't live with you, couples, colleagues, co-workers are vital to physical and mental health. So I think the public announces, uh, public health should announce this because the public needs to know these facts. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what will happen now, uh, since we have two delegates, uh, uh, two delegations, I, I they're going to go to the delegates first and not uh, allow questions. Delegation. Ah, then I'll ask members of council if they have any questions. No, see, delegation or the no, first, delegation. this guy gets questions. questions at the same Fuck. Time. Are you able to stay with us? No, 
No, I'm not. This is my time. You ask me questions now. This is the rules of order that we follow for every meeting. Chair Jim. Fuck. All right. Bruno. Bruno. Nice job. So here comes Mark Wood. Woodsy. He's going to kill it. And I'll call on Mark Wood for his delegation. And, uh, sir, welcome to uh, uh, the meeting of the Regional Municipality of Niagara Council. You may uh, begin your presentation, as I mentioned. Uh, we Thank have you, a, 10 minutes, but after the 10 minutes, Mark, uh, there will be questions coming, so you'll be able to elaborate when members direct questions to you. Welcome, yeah, and you may begin. I appreciate you welcoming to a meeting that I've uh, been staring at for three and a half hours already. Uh, Honorable Chair Bradley and distinguished oh, members of council. Oh, starts off with a burn. That's my boy. Against the class order dated November 11th and how it is directly and solely directed at food premises. That should be a red flag immediately as anyone that has spent more than five seconds on the region website knows that food service is a footnote at best in most stats and charts regarding contamination and spread. We then see the list of regulations and find the big one an attestation from everyone at the table that they're from the same household. So me and three friends can go to 7-Eleven, Home, Demo, Home Depot, Walmart, Costco, and then head into a restaurant. But once we're in the restaurant, assuming that's where we contaminate each other, the restaurant is being given blame for that. That doesn't make sense. There's zero scientific proof that can put into that didn't happen during a car ride. That didn't happen while they were sharing a smoke. It didn't happen while they spent the rest of the day together. The fact that they all happen to be in a restaurant at the same time is, is a footnote. And, and logical for tracing, but Amen. you can't say that if they spent all day together that they got it at a restaurant and those numbers should be removed from the site immediately. And we'll get back to the order in a minute. Let's discuss the safety measures in a restaurant. We are the most overregulated industry in Ontario. We answer to the fire department, police department, AGCO, tobacco enforcement, by law enforcement, Ministry of Labor, WSIB, health department, and last but not least, public health. It's a crazy list of people with different interpretations of rules, but we will get back to that also as well. Restaurants are inspected quarterly by trained professionals. We have binders full of regulations we adhere to, and we understand the applications of sanitizers and disinfectants. We handle food and money and wash our hands more than most people and practice working in a safe environment 365 days a year, regardless of COVID. Many of the new rules and even suggestions are not a huge leap for an industry already trained and certified to execute bacteria and virus control. I'll take this moment to remind you that after this, we are still the only industry mentioned in the new order. Now let's get to how this order happened. Medical health officers were given omnipotent control by an act like this to step in when they perceived elected officials weren't addressing the situation properly. I believe the province and municipality have spent countless hours and effort taking this matter very seriously. So when you look at the actual order, there are reasons that are given. I can't have, don't have time to discuss them all. Let's start with number five. Socializing of persons and food premises has been associated with significant spread of COVID-19. I would love to hear what is considered significant and the details around the findings of how they were linked to food premises. Reason number six, persons infected with COVID-19 and food premises have subsequently spread COVID-19 more widely. Who are these people? Can we prove they contracted the virus in the establishment? No, we just know they were hanging out together and they had COVID and we know they were there because our industry is doing everything we can to help in contact tracing for public health. Reason number eight, Ongoing widespread disease transmission will lead to outbreaks in regions with vulnerable residents. This has nothing to do with food service. This is very obviously a reference to long-term care facilities. I don't know why it's a reason to, in, in an order that only points at food service direction. The spread of disease will further cause, will cause further disease is a logical loop we can all agree on. My problem is that is being used in reference to restaurants unfairly. Saying a sick person is more likely to make another person sick is a fact but it is not a justifiable measure for this particular occasion. Let's get back to the overregulation I'm talking about because here in itself creates another problem we have to deal with. A newly appointed bylaw enforcement officer recently confirmed with me in a face-to-face -face meeting that the AGCO was spreading false information. So was the health department and the ministry of labor. In a conversation about new regulations, I asked her to provide proof that her interpretation was correct where theirs were not. She was very helpful in discussing the regulations and pointing me in the correct direction until a single topic arose. I'm getting price gouged on plexiglass. I need some more directions to the regulations. Well, Mark, it says that you need to have plexiglass or impermeable materials separating your tables. I'm like, okay, but to what height does that divider need to be? 
Well, Mark, it doesn't say here, but you should know that the average person is six feet tall and that the barricade should uh, should be something that would resemble something around two six foot people. I'm getting gouged on plexiglass. <laughs> person is not six feet tall. Herein creates a problem where somebody's making up a statistic that is incorrect for the sake of trying to explain something that they can't explain properly because it wasn't worded correctly in the first place. The order is another piece in a pile of rules that are already misleading. By the time everyone gets near the same page, the rules are altered again, leaving it up to multiple interpretations all over again. The province has spent a great deal of resources creating this new color zone system. It's not without its flaws, but it has addressed two things very correctly. One, all regions are different and should be treated as such. Two, all regions react and alter in real time and a 14 day reevaluation period allows hope and encouragement to get things under control and evaluate the situation better and add more information to the flow to create better understanding. The section 22 order was put in place before the first 14 day period was even given a chance and with a monumental and significant end date of January 1st. There are a total of 2,500 hospitality related businesses for over 36,000 employees across Niagara. It's been stated before. Accommodation and food service is the number one employer of people in the Niagara region. We're also the fastest growing category of employer in this region. Stats Canada implies that 30% of all of the businesses we're talking about in this category are less than six months away from bankruptcy. So as we discuss the zero deaths linked to food service, let's debate that against the consequences of what we're doing. If 30% go under, that would represent 85 181 jobs before even taking into account other businesses downsizing. No one needs to be told that lost jobs create serious concerns for society. We're discussing homelessness, hunger, bankruptcy, mental health, and unfortunately domestic and child abuse. These are all existing and real issues stemming from lockdowns and business regulations. I do not wish to compare illness to illness, but it's already being done. We risk poverty and hunger to save lives. But it is obvious in this situation that lives are not at risk in public contact situations. There is zero evidence to this fact. So we now weigh illness, not death, against poverty, hunger, abuse, and suicides. I don't wish to say that one should ever weigh something against something else, but that narrative was created on day one of COVID, not by me and not by people in the hospitality industry. We have taken more than our fair share of slander and have burdened an unjustified amount of the responsibility for that. We have done everything that was asked of us, and yet you still want more. I personally will need to lay off over 50% of my employees before the week is out. I still haven't called them all back from March. How many of you have lost a night's sleep trying to figure out how to feed your family? Or in my shoes, how to help an employee, an employee that I just had to fire when I'm already on the verge of bankruptcy myself? Dr. Herji recently said, our position is that these sorts of value judgments are best made by society as a whole through its elected leaders. It is clear that the public is currently split with passionate advocates on both sides of this debate. All the more reason that elected leaders should publicly debate this. His quote, I have been outspoken in many outlets about this topic leading up to today. But if we are going to sit here as influential members of society taking on a monumental role in this, we must put down the weapons and make a clear path to safety, confidence, trust, and security for all. I have a few ideas that I believe will not just assist Niagara, but could be suggested to assist the province in its search for information and understanding, and I will get to those shortly. Restaurants were shut down in Toronto for 28 days. To no surprise, it didn't slow down the virus. You believe by telling me that they can't congregate in public means that they will stay home alone or in households? Herein lies a huge part of the problem. The standard also reported that the doctor said most of the cases are the products of social gatherings largely, although not exclusively, attended by people under the age of 40. These are people getting together in their homes and their backyards and that is how the virus is infecting people. They aren't coming from gyms or grocery stores or those kinds of businesses. They aren't coming from restaurants, Dr. Haraji. Several Ontario doctors are also speaking out to call for a more balanced approach to managing the pandemic. In the interest of time, I will only quote one of those. Dr. Martha Fulford, an associate professor of Master and an infectious disease physician at Hamilton Health Sciences says, it is very hard to try to have a balanced conversation. The obsessive reporting with COVID numbers is bizarre. Nobody should be giving COVID numbers without also giving economic numbers and suicides. 
There are currently six people hospitalized for COVID in the Niagara region, six, with zero deaths from the second wave coming from anywhere except long-term care facilities. Explain to me how the new protocols are focused on food service. Niagara has a population of over 448,000 people. So we are going to put tens of thousands of people out of work to, for worse for a virus with a current 0 0.0013 hospitalization rate of the population. Let's be clear, weighing out scenarios and deciding on a logical course of action is a tougher decision than most people want to believe it is. If you side with me, people are still going to get sick. If you don't side with me, people are still going to get sick. No one wants to appear after the fact like they weren't compassionate or that lives weren't considered. But as of today, in Niagara, you are more likely to be a suicide statistic than a new death caused by COVID transmission from a public location. So the narrative is the same as it ever was. The government is here to protect the people. Public health is here to protect the people. I am here to suggest how to protect the people. We just need to step back and see who the people are that need protecting. It is no longer just the people at risk of infection. Dr. Herji, I, I hope is ultimately a good man. However, his entire focus is stopping the spread of the disease. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is his job and will remain his job years after people stop talking about COVID. He is tasked to be one-sided. That's his job description. It is time someone stood up and reminded everyone that other information is available and that plenty of others are also suffering. Thank you for your time, Chair. Whoa. Uh, thank you. Uh, wow. Very much. Woodsy I nails it. I hope I he takes all the questions first. To see which members of council, if any, <laughs> to be wise not to take any questions right about now. Members of council, if you could say which of the delegates you wish to direct your question. Yeah. That would be helpful. Woody so will answer well. for everyone. Wow. Bruno, 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 I love you and the boys. That was a strong presentation. Nobody's going to ask any questions. Watch this. Our presenters were obviously very thorough because... Uh, Wow, no, see? They know no, better. Uh, here, because so if they, they fucking common. ask this guy a question, he's going to go off like dynamite. Do you have any yet? Someone, watching the, uh, please, to determine ask a question, you fucking weaklings. Thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have any questions. I just have a comment. Uh, Thank God. Mr. That Wade gives them a chance to respond. Um, your plight is real. Your facts are real. Um, every life matters. That's an obvious um, given for all of us. But when you look at the breakdown and the research that you've done, and, and it's quite in line with some of the research that I've done also, um, it certainly makes your question if this is the absolute best approach that we could be taking, um, and if there is better means to be able to balance health with the economy, with all the aspects that COVID is uh, uh, imposing on us. So I, I just want to thank you both for doing the research that you did and coming before council. Um, I can't believe this, this is going to go without a question. And, and I do. The delegates um, do have a chance to, to respond right now. And I will continue to go do for so. it, thank dudes. You. Thank you. Respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A question to Mark. Andrew. Oh, we've got another First one. All, good, thank you good, very much good. For your presentation. It's, it's greatly. Uh, received a diss and you know our hearts are with you. Uh, I guess you realize that even if we take our uh, bylaw away, you'll have to follow within the restrictions of the province. How much of an impact will that have going back to just the orange process alone? Will you be able to survive? I know it won't be easy, but could you get through it? Who would you like to direct this to first? Uh, either one, whichever. Mr. Okay, Chair. we'll ask both and I, uh, we will Go, have Woodsy. our first delegate. Woodsy, first get in there! From the, uh, uh, city of Welland, and then from the city of St. Catharines. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Bruno, if you have one of you. Bruno, Mark. what a good guy. How can you not yes, feel for um, this man? So we're, we don't disagree with what the province is doing. Um, we understand that, you know, stuff hasn't been going in a positive direction, and, and we need to take some more measures. Um, but it's the additional measures that make it very difficult. Um, I can sit two couples at a table under 
the the province's mandate, but not under the regions. Um, you know, for we, we can split up a party of 20 into four tables um, where each of those tables uh, has different, you know, they have their own little social bubble, their, their own little families. It, it, doing this uh, really, really puts a damper on it. It's, it has scared people to come out. Um, it seems every time there's an announcement, uh, business drops and it takes a week and a half, two weeks for it to climb back up. Um, so right now, uh, I think the health department and uh, public health, I should say, has successfully scared people out. Uh, they've confused them, um, especially with the mental and physical um, health part of it, um, because it's not written to be exclusively caregivers. Um, but that's the message they're trying to promote is strictly households. Um, and like I said, there, there's so many papers out there that say meeting with your friends on a regular basis um, is good for your mental and physical health. Um, but the, the, uh, the uh, public health isn't going to talk about that. They want to keep it to households. Um, it, it's, it just doesn't make sense that these new mandates by uh, through section 22 are, are targeting specifically the restaurant industry, uh, where I hope my my points have and, and facts and data has showed that we're doing all right. We've been consistently around 2.5% of all cases. Um, that's low. Toronto, I think I read was in the teens. Um, so I, I think down here in Niagara, a lot of restaurants are taking it seriously. We will continue taking it seriously. Um, and we understand it isn't business as usual. Um, we've made it this far through four different lockdown stages, um, and I'm sure we can get through it, but this additional section 22 makes it extremely difficult. Um, Cause sometimes you just want to get away from your family for an hour and have a beer. Thank you. Thank you. And Mark? Mark, you have a response? I can your microphone off mute, Mark. Here, that'll help. Good. Uh, Councillor Whalen, how are you? Thank you for your question. Um, to be quite honest with you, I think that there's still certain flaws with the provincial system. Uh, but the reality is, as long as we're combating too many different things coming from too, too many different directions, there's only so much that can be done. The reality is uh, a unified provincial approach is easier to communicate, easier to understand, and easier for people to balance when they get those regulations in place. I think that the province has done a much better job of suggesting the reevaluation period unlike the new uh, the new order by the region that has a blanket date already stamped in stone on January 1st, which automatically instantly crushes certain things. I think the household argument is, is, is just downright ridiculous. There's no way you can scientifically prove that those people didn't uh, contaminate each other throughout the course of their day before they arrived in a, in a restaurant. Uh, I'm sorry that people have been sick. I think it's a, a huge testament to the controls already put in place by public health that we were able to trace a group of people that went into a restaurant and didn't contaminate a single other person or single other employee. I think that that's a screaming testament to the, to the wonderful controls being done and how they're being executed by restaurants. But realistically, I don't know if we can survive the provincial regulations either. If it goes to red, I'm going to be honest with you, me and, and a lot of the people that, that I speak for uh, and some of the committees I sit on, I think a lot more people are going to go under. But the reality right now is the biggest thing that's scaring people out of our restaurants that are that's promoting bankruptcy is the recent order by Niagara Region. And until that goes away, uh, discussing with the province how to better uh, better effectively produce a system that has some balances in it is kind of irrelevant. So one, one, one battle at a time, uh, this one is uh, unjustly pointed at us and, and frankly unscientifically proven. And I believe that the province is a better system, although one that still potentially could crush a lot of businesses and put a lot of people into bankruptcy before the year's out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Whalen, do you have any further questions? Yes, Mr. Chair. My question to both of you again, sorry to put you both on the spot. Of course, our health and well being is the first and foremost of this uh, council. Just a, a rough guessment. If we hit the lockdown again, how many people, being you're only a fraction of the restaurant community, how many people would your two businesses be putting out of business? How many people would be unemployed? Do you want to go first? Certainly, 70% of my staff um, would be unemployed. And that's, that's in the neighborhood of about 20 people. Um, we would hopefully be able to continue the takeout business. 
uh, and we need seven or eight or 10 people to do that. Um, uh, industry wide, I think you're talking <laughs> probably something like tens of thousands in this, in this region alone. Uh, Mark. Um, Chair and Councillor Whalen, I actually own three different establishments throughout the Niagara region. Uh, at this point in time, I'm operating at 50% of the employees I had back in March when this happened. So there's already 20 people I haven't brought back to work. Uh, if this continues and this household lockdown continues, it's scared enough business away that it's going to be in my best interest just to lock the doors and potentially reopen when we get back to green, which means that I'm, I'm potentially days away from laying off permanently anywhere between 35 and 45 people, just myself. Thank you for your comments. It is a scary predicament. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whalen. And thank you to those who have delegated this evening. We appreciate the input of uh, uh, both. Can uh, you imagine? Which have delegated One uh, councillor asked a question. Your questions give you opportunity to make rebuttals and pick up your shit. And it's too bad they only asked one question. One councillor. One councillor asked a question. Bullshit. Is there a mover and seconder to receive the uh, correspondence? I see uh, Councillor Whalen moving and Councillor Zalepa seconding. Any uh, discussion? If not, you may vote on receiving the correspondence that I know you've all read. Clerk informs me the motion has carried. Uh, we now go uh, an item for consideration, a memorandum from our trip acting chief administrative officer and AM Norio regional clerk dated November 18, 2020, respecting COVID-19 status updates. Members have uh, requested to be updated much more frequently than we have in the past. And there's a recommendation for that. Is there a mover and seconder to receive item CLC 110-220? And then if council wishes to move forward with COVID-19 workshops, a motion is required after that. So mover and seconder to receive the item. The mover is Councillor Butters. The seconder is Councillor Steele. And you may vote on receiving that present time. And the clerk informs me that is carried. Now, if council wishes to move forward with the COVID-19 workshops, a motion is required. Is there someone who wishes to move that? Uh, Councillor uh, Houston is moving it. And uh, Councillor, uh, looks like Councillor Butters seconding it. Any discussion? This will allow members of council to have the update that you've been seeking on a more frequent and uh, steady basis. Any discussion? Councillor Houston's hand is up, so I think she wishes to uh, speak. Councillor Houston. Can we also make, uh, thank you, Chair. Can we also make an attempt to issue um, some public statements a little more frequently? Uh, I did have a resident reach out and she was concerned that if we rely too much on the local paper, there is a a subscription model in place now which of course nobody's judging the local paper for you know needing to have a viable business and support local journalism but i am concerned that uh, it may restrict some of the information that residents are able to view if, if they don't have that service and i want to make sure that when dr herji is putting information out, it's as publicly available as possible. I'll ask Dr. Herji to comment on that. Good question. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think the council raises an important uh, issue. Uh, when the paywalls did come up for our Niagara Daily's papers, we did think about what are other ways to make sure we're getting our message out. So we are doing more social media. We're also trying to film videos to release information in a more dynamic format for the public. So that's another avenue we're pursuing. Uh, certainly we could put out, you know, written media releases. If you think uh, you're hearing from your constituents that that would be useful, that's certainly another option we could follow. 
Uh, thank you. And uh, anything further, Councillor Yusin? No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And thank you for the question, Councillor Foster. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Bradley. So through you, um, would there be any benefit to this being on a weekly basis for the next few weeks, um, for sure? And the only reason that I'm asking that is that it seems that uh, um, the uh, the the uh, sand beneath our feet, if we want to put it that way, is changing on a on a regular basis. Um, but I, I'm kind of thinking, uh, you know, uh, a, a slight modification to this might might be in order. I'll go to the clerk to see if that is what was contemplated, or Dr. Urgy. Is that what is contemplated? Uh, Mr. Chair, we I think when we talked about this, we were thinking bi-weekly was frequent enough while also not being so frequent that we might be meeting without having any new information to share. Obviously, on top of both of these, there's PHSSC meetings, there are council meetings where information will be shared. And so it's creating four opportunities in a month to have information. And we think it's probably enough. Obviously, you know, we suggest we would try it. And if we find that there's a need for greater frequency, we would know then based on real life experience. Councilor Foster. Yes, thank you. I'm, you know, I'm not thinking long-term, I'm thinking like particularly given some of the challenges that we're currently facing. And if we do see numbers uh, going, or perhaps maybe uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to um, um, to Dr. Herji, um, you know, perhaps maybe the ability should be given to him that if he sees, um, numbers changing um, uh, quicker or faster or, or something that seriously concerns him, um, perhaps maybe that would be a trigger to, to do a meeting for us um, as we're going on. And I, I leave that with Dr. Herji because, um, you know, we have made it very clear communication is, is going to be a big part of what's happening in the next while. So, And as you. you have said, Councillor Foster, one of the things that we've all noticed as members of council is how quickly things change. We get pronouncements from the federal government, from the provincial government, which changes the rules. And then we have other uh, eventualities that take place that cause that. So I, I uh, Dr. Herji has heard what you would have to say about uh, providing other information on a more frequent basis if necessary, but at least it would be bi-weekly uh, on a standard basis. Uh, Councillor Rigby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, would you uh, kindly put this motion up on the screen because I sure uh, I'm not exactly sure where we are on this. Yeah, on I'd the be happy agenda to do that. that I have up. God well, bless Tim. God bless Tim. You know, Tim often gets lost in the conversation, which is surprising because Tim's got a lot of experience as a former mayor. He should have a little bit more sense to how procedure works. COVID-19 status update workshops. Well, okay. So I have a failure in my uh, my computer because I don't know what that is. Uh, but if this is to have regular reports, is this being decided on a two thirds vote? Because that is an item that I was bringing forward about two weeks, three weeks ago. That was uh, related as we recall to the masks. This is related I to was overall, related but I know to what you're talking about. It was know exactly a regular report about. and it had nothing to, yeah. it certainly was mask we were talking about, yeah. but it had to do with this whole issue we are now faced with. I will ask the clerk. Thank you, Councillor Rigby. I'll uh, ask the clerk. Through you, Chair. So this item is related to the memorandum that's on the agenda CLC 110. Uh, well, I have that, but there's nothing in my agenda that I can read. So you should have the memo there in your agenda. And then when you get to the bottom, it suggests that if council is interested in pursuing workshops, that uh, we would need a motion to uh, direct staff to go ahead with that. Well, that's unfortunate, but I do I have that motion or that agenda up and there's no more, nothing about the, 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 the uh, discussion on what we're talking about. Uh, Clark, is it off the C CAO's report? It's no, it's under co correspondence for consideration item 6.2.1 on your agenda. CLC 110 2020. Okay, so God bless Mayor Tim, but this is what I'm talking about. He just does not understand process. 
It's sad. Frustrating. But he should know. I oh, even okay, know, and I've never been elected to anything. See one ten. That's correct. Okay, that's a memorandum from Mr. Ron Tripp. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, there's, there, I have nothing attached to it to tell me what it is. <laughs> Jim Bradley's gonna go insane. Clark. How do you manage sure as a chair? How do you manage guys like this that just, they don't come prepared? It is to have regular uh, reports. Is that what it's about? Yeah, regular workshops. Right. Then, then it should be a two-thirds report, I think, because this is exactly what I was asking for uh, during that discussion about masks. Through you, through you, Chair, this is to have scheduled workshops. So following the same format as the budget workshops, yeah. it would not okay. be a report. It would be a format where counselors could attend. Dr. Herji would provide an update on what's been happening and counselors would have the opportunity to ask him any questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I have no objection to this, by the no, way. I, I just, I, it's a process, a procedure that uh, I was frustrated about this through two weeks ago or three. Tim, you finally won the day. I, yeah, I took a thank you. Finally won the day. Hughes. Counselor Hughes understands mine. Yeah, we, Counselor Houston helps. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank God yeah, for okay. Counselor we'll, we'll, Houston. We'll Thank God for Counselor Houston and her clavicle and her sad mouth. What the fuck? Counselor Easton. There comes Sandra Easton. Mr. Chairman, um, <clears throat> this motion that's on the board, this is related to CLC 110, correct? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Um, maybe I have brought, the, I may have brought the wrong report up just um, I'm sorry. It's just that I was looking at possibly an amendment. I was looking at a motion here from Councillor Hewson. And can you tell me what that is related to? Which report that's related to? That, uh, that will be later on. That will be related to requesting uh, financial compensation from the federal and provincial government uh, for assistance to the hospitality industry. So it's not related to this particular item. All right, so is that 8.1? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. My apologies. Uh, I see no further names, so uh, I'll ask you to vote on this motion electronically. Sorry, Chair, can I ask one more question? Yes, please, go ahead. Um, Dr. Herji, my understanding is the province is reviewing um regions on on a two-week basis is that correct uh mr chair from my discussions with the province they're going to look at the data actually almost weekly but that will only be to review whether or not they need to raise regions to the higher level the intention is that no region would go down a level probably until 28 days have elapsed Okay, so really on, on a weekly basis, we could move, They could, there could be a decision to move us up. in either, yeah. is that correct? Uh, it, it, every week there could be a decision to move up to red. They'd only really make a decision to move us down say, to yellow after 28 days have elapsed. Okay, that's my question, thank you. Thank you, and I see Councillor DeZero wishes to speak. Councillor DeZero. Yes, thank you. I just have a quick question. I support the motion to have uh, regular uh, update workshops. I guess my, my question uh, would be, are, are these, would these be just prior to a committee of the whole meeting or a council meeting? We're not gonna set aside a day every, like I'm just trying to figure out timing more than anything. I'll so go to the you, clerk for that. Yes, go to the yeah, clerk. You. Uh, through you, Chair, the memo indicates they would be on Fridays between one and 2 p.m. through Zoom. Oh boy. Okay, that it's okay. It's and just it, attendance would be uh, uh, voluntary. So. Yeah, but it's just odd to me that we would it would be on a different day than any other meeting that we've got. I I my preference would be like an hour before a committee the whole meeting or an hour before a council meeting, 
just so it's on the same day, but uh, it is what it is. That's fine. I'll try and make it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Height. Yes, you do, Dr. Hershey. Um, it, you just said that the province will not move us down for 28 days, um, regardless of what our numbers are? Mr. Chair, that is my understanding based on the information they gave us. They want to see regions be in uh, left what's called two incubation periods of 14 days to be sure that there's a downward trend before they would shift us. Um, a follow-up um, regarding our numbers, 40 odd were for that one period that has affected us for 28 days. Is that what you're telling me? That one anomaly? Uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, farm outbreak that contributed a large number of cases didn't actually impact which uh, level we fell into. If you excluded those cases, we were still at a level where we would land in the orange. Okay, my last question is, if the province isn't going to act for 28 days, your section 22 order, I'm hoping I'm going to hear you say it could change every week if need be. Uh, Mr. Chair, we are not tied to the province's timeline, so we could definitely make changes to our order if we thought the reason lied for that. So that's good news then, because as you review the numbers every week, and we have meetings every few weeks, hopefully um, your order could change maybe even by next week. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Height. Uh, I'll ask you now to vote on the motion on the screen. The staff be directed to proceed with scheduling regular COVID-19 status update workshops. And the clerk will watch to see how the vote is going. The motion is carried. <clears throat> and I'll go to 7.1 Chief Administrative Officer's report. And this is uh, COVID-21-2020, COVID-19 response and business continuity in public health and emergency services, November 2020. As a mover and seconder for report, report CAO 21-2020. Looks like the mover is Councillor Vallala and the seconder is Councillor Ugolini. Any discussion? If not, you may vote on it. On the motion. The motion is carried. Uh, now we have number eight motions. In order for council to consider the motions at this meeting, an affirmative vote of two thirds of the members present will be required. Should the motion pass, council will consider both motions. One, 8.1 is support for Niagara's local businesses through the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, uh, that's Councillor Houston. The second will be from Councillor Senzik, uh, which is a different motion, which uh, I think he's, uh, Walter, have you, you circulated that motion? It'll yes. be it's on the screen. Yes, it's already yes. part of the agenda. That's right, good. So you know what they are. Uh, so I'll ask for a motion uh, which requires two thirds uh, members present uh, to consider the motions at this meeting. We have a motion mo mover for that motion. So I moved. have Councillor Steele is moving it and I have Councillor Campion seconding it. Uh, I guess we vote on this now. I don't think that's debatable. So we vote on this now to allow those motions to be presented at this meeting. And the clerk says that motion has carried. Uh, so now we go to uh, Councillor Houston for her motion. And I understand Councillor Height will be the seconder. Councillor Houston, would you present your motion? Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a motion to support Niagara's local businesses through the second wave of the COVID pandemic. Um, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Height. 
whereas the COVID-19 pandemic continues to pose a real and imminent threat to the health and of the residents of the Niagara region, and whereas public health authorities at the provincial and local level have implemented reasonable measures to protect the health of the residents of Niagara and Ontario, and whereas these measures have may have the unintended effect of disadvantaging certain businesses in the Niagara region, namely those in the tourism, hospitality, and food services sectors, and whereas regional council formally recognizes the important part that Niagara's more than 1,200 restaurants play in our economy, employing thousands of residents through the entire year, and whereas regional council also recognizes that Niagara's tourism, hospitality, and food service sector are connected to a supply chain of numerous sectors that rely on these businesses operating to continue to provide painful employment to thousands of residents. And whereas the Niagara region has been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic as compared to many other areas of the province. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the regional chair be directed to advocate to the provincial and federal government for financial support for Niagara's struggling hospitality, tourism, and food service sectors. This is the only reason I uh, stuck around tonight. Councillor Houston, we have a clavicle. So, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I'm going to continue the feed. Mark, get some rest, man. I know this has been a long few days for you, and I know how stressful presenting to council can be. So get some rest, man, or you're going to be next with COVID. Take care of your immune system, everybody. I'm going to continue to broadcast. I put up a Zoom link. If you want to spout off, click it in your live. You don't need video, but you will be live audio. All right. Uh, in addition to that, uh, as, uh, to be helpful, I'm not uh, trying to intervene in, as a member of council, but uh, sending it to our federal and provincial members as well. Would you like that to happen, our local federal and provincial members, because uh, they have to advocate as well. Very good idea. Thank you for the suggestion. So, so I'm not amending it. I'll, I'll allow you to to add that to yours. So uh, uh, I'm OK. I'm OK with that amendment if Councillor Height is. Councillor Height, is it all right to have that circulated to the local MPs and MPPs? Yes, I thought the same thing when I was reading it. and uh, but. Having you uh, get a hold of uh, the federal and uh, provincial representatives is important as well. Good. You have the motion before you. Is there any discussion? Councillor Easton is first, followed by Councillor Zalepa. Councillor Easton. Um, Mr. Chairman, through you to Councillor Houston, I just want to ensure that those who have been working uh, diligently since uh, the early summer on items two and three. Uh, that their efforts haven't been overlooked because Great. I think that there are many shop local um, and buy local uh, initiatives that are in place, but it never, um, it, it never, you know, it's never a problem to reinforce these things, but I know a substantial amount of time, effort and money has been spent on shop local um, initiatives. That's good news. Thank you, Councillor Eason. Yeah. Councillor Zalepa. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, I appreciate this motion coming forward. Uh, definitely, um, I, I, I want to say, you know, there's, um, I agree with Councillor Easton, though, that there, there's some work that's already been done, so I, yeah. you know, I think we can tie that in. But I would like to say that this is a, it gives me a bit of the warm and fuzzies. I think you need to get a little more specific about what financial assistance we can provide. And, and I know recently the province uh, has enacted an ability for the uh, municipalities to draw on uh, business education tax um, deferral payment structures and allow the municipality to apply for that uh, to, to get a net effect of zero for the taxpayer. Uh, I'd like to see that incorporated here. I think we should be um, looking to see how we can apply for business education tax deferrals for our businesses uh, and using the provincial monies to offset that expense. Uh, I would appreciate that to be included in here in number one. I think it goes a little further and actually gets a specific um, 
a specific uh, strategy to actually put some money on the table yeah. as opposed to just putting the cup out again. That program, this is why Gary Zaleppa would like to include will be a great as part of a politician. You want to shut them down? I'm not a fan of socialism and, and paying off businesses, but there's no way you can replace the income that is displaced by the shutdown. There's no way you can do it with tax deferrals and incentives and all that kind of stuff. So do whatever we can do. We'll add that. And, and as Councillor Zaleppa mentioned, I, my understanding is that's not a, a cost to the municipality. The province has assisted with that education portion, portion of the tax program they set up. So good, good for you mentioning that. Uh, Councillor Ugolini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to add that we had great success when we uh, sent a letter from the uh, all 12 mayors and the regional yep. chair to the government on the patio issue. And I think we should take that same approach with this. Uh, as far as just having the regional chair, it should include the 12 mayors because I think that brings us all together and uh, we had great success on the patios with that. I think we should use that same approach here. Very good suggestion. I'll be happy to circulate that to uh, all the mayors and ask if, if they see fit that they sign on to the letter. Good suggestion and, and congratulations on having the Thorold Tunnel open. Thank you. That's just for you, just so you know that. Any other speakers? Okay, we'll ask for you to vote on the motion now electronically. And the motion is carried. Now uh, 8.2 is section 22 order and COVID-19 enforcement. I call on Councillor Senzik for his motion. And do you have a seconder, Councillor Senzik, by the way? Yeah, Councillor Diodati. So the, the motion is on the screen and give everybody an opportunity okay, to click we'll... on their agenda. And as they're taking their time to, to read the four, the five bullet points, uh, just in, the important part to note is uh, striking that balance, but also having the understanding that enforcement is a is a key aspect of getting a handle on on COVID nineteen and being able to publicly see the enforcement taking place. So there's there's some strategic elements to the motion, chair, and uh, I believe that it it captures the balance and first and foremost, it's it's also protecting the community, but getting the community more engaged. And I know that the local media is doing their job, uh, but clearly we need to diversify the messaging and target it towards those demographics that are, we're seeing an, an increase. And so um, I think this is a multifaceted approach and hopefully if it's approved by council that the uh, Dr. Herji will uh, consider this, this direction as well. All right, I'm going to, uh... Uh, be uh, as the word superfluous here. I'm going to read it out uh, so that all can hear. We can all see it. You're going to tell me everybody can read, but I'll read it out. The regional council recommend that the acting medical officer of health amend the directive under section 22 of the Health Protection and Promotion Act with respect to who can be seated at a table at a restaurant, and to remove the requirement limited to household members only. Amen. And the rest of this resolution says we have no confidence in Dr. Hirji. To the Board of Public Health of Niagara Region before being released publicly and the compliance with the provincial... In other words, you priority. spoke too soon and we don't want you speaking before you talk to us. ...with area CAOs and NRP regarding strict enforcement of COVID-19 related bylaws and public health regulation to flatten the curve. Four, that public health work with area CAOs to immediately target those demographics that are causing the increase of COVID-19 with an aggressive communication campaign. And five, that any fines issued related to COVID-19 related bylaws and public health regulations by the NRP public health and municipal bylaw officials be published publicly. 
and oh, don't forget the LCBO because they have the power to inflict fines and charges as well. What do you want to publish the names of infractions for? Mm, I don't know about that. If not, I'll ask you to vote. Sorry. Nobody's going to talk? Said, Discussion. Oh, Mr. Chairman, just Fucking quickly, debate the shit. Um, item number five, if um, a legal could just pass her eyes over that and tell us whether that is uh, something that um, would... Uh, no. No conviction, no publication. Any comment? Uh, so, through the chair, um, by fines issued, um, I would assume that we're speaking to convictions. So, once convictions are imposed, um, they could certainly be published. Other agencies do take that approach. Ministry of Labor, most prominently, um, publishes records of convictions um, on a public basis to inform and educate the public. Duh. Uh, I guess I was right on that one. Hey, hey uh, drunk drivers aren't convicted before you publish their names. And, and um, um, is this, um, Ms. Gibbs, is this consistent then with the Highway Traffic Act uh, convictions? Legal. Through the chair. What so the fuck? I need to get the elected I, to council. Other agencies do publish um, convictions. Um, in some instances, I think um, charges are also published. So if the intent of this is to publish <coughs> charges where there has not yet been a conviction, um, I think we would just want to make sure that that is also clearly stated because <coughs> as, um, Council are aware when you have been charged, you do have a right to contest the charge, um, which may be in the form of a trial or otherwise. Um, and we would want to ensure that if we're releasing this information, we're doing so in a way that provides that context that they have not yet been convicted if we're doing it on the no. basis of charges. Release um, of so information before conviction, period. It, depending on what their goal is and what they consider appropriate. Um, and I would leave that to Council to determine in this instance. Okay. And um, Mr. Chairman, I just have a question of the of the mover um, under just a moment. I have to remove this. Um, in I, in item number three, is it the intention for uh, the medical officer of health solely to be responsible for that communication plan um, or the, the strict enforcement, or is this something that should be handled uh, by the corporation? <laughs> Uh, Notice how vague number three is. So you, you know what? You can do whatever you want as long as it's in line with flattening the curve. Just pointed out tonight that October 5th there and about there was an article about like, something that was ha happening, uh, but the lack of a coordinated effort around the enforcement, which could have taken place. If there's more of a focused effort within <laughs> the medical officer's team it doesn't have to be the 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 acting uh, medical officer himself but his team needs to be leading a plan with the area caos because there's a breakdown in communication that's occurring between the caos and the public health uh, department and the nrp should be at that table as well and, and someone needs to have, take the leadership role and we have evidence of that I think you heard it today when between October 5th and November 14th, the, the, there was there was no coordinated effort around enforcement. Well, okay, I understand. All right, I'm just looking for the coordination of all of these important facts to be to be uh, attended to. And I'm just looking at the workload and I'm looking at some of the things we heard about um, um, difficulty in replacing key people on the team, but I understand the direction you're going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Campion. Hey, Chair, I just want to ask for a recorded vote, please. Thank you, Mayor Campion. You are the mayor still, aren't you? Huh? Oh, all right, all right. I got it, I just heard it now. Councillor Dude's got his mouth full. Dude, Council take your soother out of your mouth. What the fuck are you eating? That's Senzik's job. Specific, like, if, if by chance a, a kid has a party and gets charged, you want to charge him for being stupid as opposed to a, a corporation or a retailer? I can't speak to the legality of a kid being charged under a bylaw and 
I think it would be a matter of the discretion of public health and Niagara Regional Police that would be the ones that would have the discretion. I long to have a voice like Walter Senzik's because it is so naturally deep and sexy. How do you feel about that? Well, I think the time for education is over and if they're having a house party with 20, 30 people in it, then the people who have been fined should be acknowledged publicly. And again, I don't want to get into the shame game, but I think we got to start publicly stating to the broader public. I don't want to get into the shame game, but I want to get into the shame game. So if you break the law, if you break what we consider to be the law, we're going to out you publicly without a trial, without due process. That's the shame game, Wally. Now into a period of finding. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Councillor Rigby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to call a question. What? Uh, Rigby can't call the question. That cuts off Councillor Foster. What the fuck? Uh, Rigby, uh, Tim, uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor. I couldn't see that you were being had your vote in there. Tim, do you want to withdraw your motion then? Fuck, uh, Tim, it, back it, it, up. Councillor Foster is the last one. Yeah, he's the only one. Okay. Shut up. Oh, Councillor Rigby is so, very magnanimously. We'll bind till after Councillor yeah, Foster okay. and it'll be covered. <laughs> All right, great. What the uh, fuck? He wants to he wants to stifle debate and just call the question? He thinks he's got the votes, maybe. You know, Tim is not devious enough to prepare the votes. Uh, part one and uh, through, I guess, to uh, to uh, Councillor Senzik. So, so um, thank you. He's going to let Rob Foster, to, who's from Lincoln, Ask his question. Thanks, Mayor of, Tim. Of how this all fits together um, within uh, um, within that's with, with what's been going on with this, and then the second part is um, um, I, I I see where you're going with uh, this, basically making the the recommendation to the acting officer of health, who, by the way, uh, doesn't answer to us on this, so. I'm wondering, uh, you know, perhaps and maybe is, to hey, Councillor Sensen should also. Oh my gosh, he's not bound by anything that you passed tonight, you tools. I've been here since seven thirty. No, four thirty. It's nine o'clock. Jeepers. Question by Councillor Foster. Yeah, through through the chair to Councillor Foster. Clarification in wording or clarification as it relates to. Uh, the provincial framework versus the the local section 22. That's through you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, actually, kind of both, really, when it's all said and done. I mean, the um, because the reality is is that we have to make sure that what we're saying, you know, meshes up with what the province is saying about uh, numbers, etc. Um, but then the second part is making sure that uh, you know we we have some of these rules clearly laid out. So. Um, you know, for instance, um, I heard some some interesting nuances during the discussion from Dr. Herji on on what constitutes that uh, you know the household or or the people that are involved. So, I, I would just like to see maybe a, a little bit more a nuancing with the thing. So, anyway, um, I, it's your motion, so it's just a thought. Thank you, Tim. Tim, you want to call oh, the yes, question Tim. now, Tim? Make sure that council knows. The motion by Councillor Senzik and, Council, and seconded by Councillor Diodati is about to be called. In fact, recommend that the uh, rule set down by the uh, medical officer of health be rescinded. Yes, because it says and to remove the requirement limited to household members. Good. Just so you know what you're voting on. Thank you. I don't think I don't see anybody else. Who wishes to speak? <laughs> Jim, and what do you got? A lozenge in your fucking yap? Ask for a, a um, vote, a recorded vote. You know this is going to go down, right? I'll ask the clerk to conduct a recorded vote. Here we go, kids. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Butters. I will vote uh, in favor. Duh. Councillor Campion. In favor. Councillor Kiokio. In favor. Council wow, Mayor. it's going to roll. I can't vote. I caught a conflict of interest. Thank you. Councillor Dart, thank you. In favor. Councillor DeCero. Yes. Councillor Easton. It's going to roll. 
Yes. Councillor Edgar. Dude, are you guys paying attention to this shit? And, and keep in mind, none of this is binding. Yes, uh, I support this. It's rolling. Councillor Foster. You're going to have a yes. unanimous decision by government, by elected government officials. Councillor Greenwood. In favor. You're Councilor having... Height. Yes, I support this. This is a unanimous Councilor decision Kingston. by an elected body to rescind. Yes, I support it. Councilor Dr. Hirji's tyrannical lockdown on local business, and it means shit. Councillor Junkin. Yes. Councillor Nicholson. In favor. Councillor Redekop. Councillor Rigby. Yes. Councillor Senzek. Yes. Councillor Steele. Wow. Yes. Councillor Ugolini. In favor. Wow. In favor. Councillor Whalen. Does this what? In favor. <laughs> yes. That's carried, Chair. Wow. The motion is carried. Unanimously. There was no dissension. One abstention. George we'll Dart. Go to bylaws. What what the fuck happens now? Nine point one. <laughs> so an elected regional body has now as far as i can tell like i've been here since 4 30 so i'm a little punch drunk okay but i think what just happened was <laughs> walter senzik brought a motion that chair bradley clarified before they voted on that was rescinding the doctor's orders and they voted unanimously in support. Where's Laura? Yep. She ejected from the meeting. What's going on now? Is that it? There being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. See you later, folks. Oh, see Either you one. later. That's it. <laughs> wow, dudes. Well, you're stuck with me. I don't know what the fuck that was, but it sounded like to me that you just watched a live vote. Of an elected body of council being the region. presentations made by two delegations tonight one from the rex hotel which i will tell you bruno i was almost in tears i'm not emotional when it comes to this stuff normally but bruno you make the best pizza in the world now i haven't been around all that much but i know pizza bruno was it johnny does he is johnny the manager over there and you could see the kids in the background. They were fighting back tears, man. This is their life. Mark Wood comes up. Mark Wood is burning the candle at both ends, right? So if he takes a little time off right now, I would not be surprised. And Mark, take care of yourself, man, because you're not good to anyone, but I'm proud of you, man. You started this whole shit. You gave me some access. You did the right thing, man. Except next time you present to council, you're going to have to line up a few questions. <laughs> because the questions is where you get to take your shots. That's when you have latitude. You use your 10 minutes, and then you fucking carve them in the uh, answers to their questions. But only one question. Disappointing. But from where I'm sitting... I'm pretty sure what we just saw was a unanimous decision to rescind Dr. Mustafa Hirji's order to not have... Now, see, here's the thing. I've been saying it all night. 
Dr. Hirji does not answer to counsel. So no matter what they did tonight, it doesn't really matter. In the greater scheme of things, as far as a logistical like flow downstream, how the order, how the chain of command works, dude answers to the province and ultimately to the premier, I guess. Ah, uh, Mark, man, you're still posting. Get some, get some rest, man. You're right. They should have asked you more questions. And this is this is this is a neophyte's experience. You've never done this before. I can give you mega props, bro. But uh, yeah, you need to line up a few questions because here's the thing: when you make a strong delegation and you have uh, supporting facts and you tell a heartfelt story and you're humble and forceful like you were, Mark, and like Bruno and the kids were. The kids, I don't know. Bruno's children at the Rex Hotel on Niagara Street in Welland. Best, best pizza ever, anywhere. You put all that effort into them, to this presentation, and you're taxed, and then you waited online four hours to speak, and then no one no one even asks you a question. But this is what happens, man. Live and learn. Your first time at the plate, and you did well, and I don't know what turns of this, but I can't see how Dr. Mustafa Hirji can uh, stick to his lockdown and these restrictions on an industry that is not having an adverse effect on the transmission of COVID-19. <laughs> I get locked down, but I get up again. All right, well, I couldn't walk when I got out of bed this morning. I and I'm not really, I'm not bullshitting. I'm like, I could not walk when I got out of bed tomorrow, uh, this morning. Bad back and sciatic combined. Uh, my back is out, was out, and then I walked for an hour and a bit. I don't know, 4K. It was, I'm down from a 1030 kilometer to like a 50, like a 1430 kilometer. I'm, today I was four minutes off my kilometer pace. <laughs> I was, I should have had a fucking cane. And, uh, worked out all right. And I've been sitting in this chair and as soon as I try and get out of this, well, actually I'm a lot better than t I walked and I fucking loosened it up and we're good. So hit the page. I'm going to get out of here. There's no reason for me to keep you on here anymore. Um, props to Mark, props to Bruno. No props to this fucking guy right here, Mustafa Hirji. Now, I don't wish harm on anyone, but let's just do this. These are uh, Mustafa Hirji's likes. Laura Yip, they're really tight. Laura Yip bailed from the meeting tonight, it seemed like. After she asked her question, she got out. I think she knew that the fix was in. Sucker. I got no fucking contacts at the region anymore. Contacts. Well, I do, but I don't tap them because I don't give a flying rat's ass. Uh, Julie S. Lalonde is a radical left-wing feminist. Uh, hi, Taylor Swift wannabe. Uh, I think I'm a feminist and I'm a buzzkill. Julie. I don't know. If you just scroll through this band's um, feed, he really likes Laura and Julie, radical feminist. I don't know what potatoes literally in their form. Is it like a is that a vegetarian joke? I guess David Frum. Now Stevie C. Abrams has been claiming that she got cheated out of her election, like what four years ago. <gasps> He's a Joe Biden fan. Now, keep in mind, I am cruising Dr. Mustafa Hirji's likes. 
These are the likes that are, oh, hey now. Now, the region of public health, obviously, is him. Mitt Romney. Romney. Mitt Romney. Congratulations to President-elect Joe Biden. Um, um, Has that been confirmed? I don't think so. Ivanka's dad, Julie Lalonde, you are, um, I'm not sure what Mustafa was thinking. I know what I'm thinking. I think you're a feminist uh, robot man, a man hater. It's okay. We know how to deal with you. Megan McCain, Laura Yip, another Laura Yip. Now, Laura Yip hasn't tweeted Jesus fucking Christ in a long time, has she? In fact, if you search at Laura Yip with this address right here, this one, and Jesus fucking Christ, just put fucking Christ because she used to spell Jesus all G-U-Z-E-E-Z, you know, something. All of a sudden, those Jesus fucking Christ tweets are gone. I, I wonder why. It wasn't because of the, um, you know, Laura, when you said, I won't validate his uh, claim with a comment, but when the media called, you gave him a big cry story about how you've been bullied and how you might not run again. And then all your minions spent 45 days sending me hate mail. Well, you're welcome, Laura. I did you the greatest favor. I mobilized your base for your re-election campaign. You're welcome. The Lincoln Project. The Lincoln Project is one of Dr. Hirji's favorites. <laughs> um, we're not a big fan of the Trumps. I'll just say that. <laughs> Look at this fucking clown. Hi, Laura. Oh, fuck. I should like a Laura Yip tweet just for the hell of it. I retweet, I quote tweeted her today. Julius Lond. These are all left wing activists. Jake Tapper. Like, we could go on and on. This man is a public bureaucrat. I'm ashamed to say. I don't care what your politics are, just keep them to yourself. How about we pay you $250,000 a year and you don't like Hillary Clinton's tweets? How about that? Fuck. What a goof. I hope this fucking guy gets fired. I'm not calling for his head. I'm not calling for violence. Unlike what Matt Holmes said today. Oh, Matt Holmes said, oh, they're calling for his head. Who fucking called for his head, you fucking clown? Matt Holmes. Nobody fucking called for the guy's head. We might have said fire Fauci. <laughs> Here, G, whatever, herpes, fire herpes. Get rid of them. Fuck. <laughs> oh, Christine Elliott. He liked a Christine Elliott tweet. The, what this is with the Lincoln Project tweets? I remember when Republicans fought communism. We still do. I'm not a Republican, but you're a fucking fascist dictator. Man, I need to get out of here. Look at this. Andrew Coyne. Oh, ho, ho. oh, I hope you're not severely disappointed. <laughs> With the uh, well, Look at this fucking clown. Look at this. This is all... This is, we're going to October 9th. Let's see. Let's go back. Yeah. Total collapse. Liking. See, I'm all for free speech. But this fucking clown gets paid $250,000 a year to close down businesses and to like fucking the Lincoln Project and radical feminists tweets. That's what we pay this clown for. Wow. <laughs> September 30th. Oh, he was really quiet for a while, eh? September 
20th, October. Yeah. He really picked up his game after the election, it looks like. They hit the result. They knowingly endangered others. You know what this guy's going to do now? He's going to protect you. In a way that you are unable to do for yourself. He's going to mandate a lockdown. Get ready for it, people. Thanks for tuning in. Fucking exhausted. And I am out. How oh, what would uh, 919, eh? Wow. Five hours of total bullshit. Peace. Love. Hug your neighbor. Fucking take that mask off, you clowns. <laughs>